Uh, welcome, Internet of People. This is the third Internet of Things microconference at Linux Plum Plumbers Conference. So that's Linux Plumbers Conference 2021. And I'm just going to do a quick introduction. My name is Chris Freed. Uh, I've been co organizing the microconference for the last three years. Um, and this is actually the first year that I don't have a big chunk of work to do or uh, any presentation myself. So it's kind of nice. I'll be able to sit back and watch everyone else present. Uh, and I've gotten to know all of our presenters pretty well over time and quite confident that they're all going to have some really excellent things to talk about. Um, just moving on here. This is what our schedule will be like for today. Um, our first presenter is Manny. He's with Lenaro, uh, and he's got a lot of expertise in Laura Wan and Laura. Um, second presenter day is Vaishnav Ma, who uh, is with BeagleBoard, uh, and I had the pleasure of working with Vaishnav on uh, the Beagle Connect Freedom, which is a pretty awesome piece of open source hardware that's coming from BeagleBoard.org. And I think I just got the pull request from Jason to add the board to Zephyr the other day, so I'm quite excited about that. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Stefan Schmidt, and he will be talking about the IoT Gateway Blueprint with Thread and Matter, which is awesome. Uh, we actually had Amit yesterday in the referee track talking about how we need these blueprints for end-to-end -end solutions for products. And I think it's really exciting that we're now looking at productizing things with Zephyr and Linux. I think that's kind of the way of the future, you know, all under one umbrella, which is nice. Um, next, we'll have Yuval Perez, who's with Google. Uh, Yuval has been doing lots of work with the um, Android CHRE, which is a sensor framework uh, and sort of like a message bus as well, but he'll fill us in on all of the details. Um, lastly, we'll have Jonathan Berry, who is a uh, founder of Goliath, and he's going to talk about Zephyr and Linux and the two of them working in concert. Um, so let's see. Oh, I'm a little bit early, but um, uh, yeah, and that's kind of it. Um, maybe I'll just fill in the next three minutes. Um, so this year, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because it's not like I haven't been busy. I actually, I was lucky enough to become the um, long-term support release manager for the Zephyr project for version 2.7.0. And it is, wow, extremely busy. Um, I'm doing that on behalf of my company. Uh, I'm at Facebook now. Uh, and Facebook is also a diamond sponsor of Linux Plumbers Conference. So thanks, Facebook. Um, giving me great opportunities to continue on the work that I was doing before joining Facebook and also kind of promoting um, all sorts of cool technology that Facebook is developing internally inside the open source ecosystem and the Linux ecosystem. Um, let's see, have I, oh, two minutes left. Um, uh, let's see what else. Um, there have been some minor changes from last year. A um, couple of fix-ups in, fix in Zephyr itself uh, that uh, came from last year's Linux plumbers, which are really exciting. So my, uh, there's um, MDNS service discovery, um, one of them, a couple of fix ups there. Um, we've had a lot of work in Zephyr, um, and I know that uh, we'll have some news from Vaishnav, who presented last year as well, and Stefan, who presented last year as well. So there's been lots of advances last year, since last year that came out of those talks. And uh, it will be quite exciting, I'm sure. Uh, and I hope that it spurs a lot of discussion. So um, I'll be looking at the comments and matrix chat. Um, feel free to check out the shared notes area, or if you're coming to us from uh, YouTube Live, um, you, can also, you might be able to join matrix chat if you've registered for Linux Plumbers Conference. Um, that being said, I think I'm just about ready to hand it over. So uh, our first presenter is Manny from Lenaro. So thanks very much, Manny. And I'm going to just give you presenter now. Here we are. And 
you should have presenter. Mm, yep. And I'm going to turn off my mic and video. So thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Manivaran Sadasivam. I'm working as a kernel engineer at the uh, Qualcomm landing team of Linaro. And today we are going to discuss about the uh, LoRa and LoRaWAN support in uh, Zephyr. Let's uh, get started. So this is the agenda for today's discussion. Um, first, I'll uh, give a quick introduction to LoRa and LoRaWAN technologies and uh, why Zephyr is an autos. Then um, I'll give a quick status update on the uh, LoRa and LoRaWAN support in Zephyr and uh, some of the planned improvements uh, which is going to come in the near future. And uh, finally, I'll touch base on the uh, proposal for uh, adding the native LoRa and LoRaWAN support in Linux kernel. It's uh, going to be exciting. All right, so what is LoRa? So LoRa is an acronym of long range. Um, it is a wireless uh, LP1 wireless technology based on the uh, chip spread spectrum modulation technique. Um, so LoRa was initially developed by Cyclio, a French company, but it got later acquired by uh, Semtech. And then uh, Semtech started producing the radio chips uh, such as SX, uh, SX12 series, SX126, uh, 7X, etc. cetera. Um, so LoRa operates in a license-free sub gigahertz frequency range that uh, varies between regions. So it is 865 megahertz in India where I'm living and 868 in uh, Europe, et cetera. Um, so LoRa is uh, perfectly suitable for uh, applications uh, that require low data rate and uh, that needs to cover long range. Uh, for instance, uh, LoRa can be used for uh, telemetry applications and uh, smart metering applications because these applications require only tens and 20 bytes of data being sent uh, uh, sent in uh, once in a while, uh, but over a long range, such as five to six kilometers, depending upon your antenna and uh, some of the other parameters. Okay, what is LoRaWAN? So LoRaWAN is uh, the long range wide area network. So it is actually the uh, software implementation. It's not actually a physical IP or anything. Um, so LoRaWAN, um, it uh, use it actually sits on top of LoRa Phi, that's the uh, LoRa radio, and uh, it uses LoRa uh, radio for transmitting the uh, uh, LoRa packets to the other device, which is usually the end node to gateway, and gateway to end node, or even end node to end node in some cases. Um, so the one good thing about LoRaWAN is that the spec is open. Uh, that means uh, anyone can go and uh, download the spec and then create their own LoRaWAN implementation on top. But that is a check with that. You only need to use the uh, LoRa uh, radio that is proprietary and that's coming from Semtech. So uh, if you are using the LoRa, uh, you, you should use the LoRa uh, Phi that is uh, closed source and you can implement your open source LoRaWAN stack on top of it. And uh, when talking about LoRaWAN, there are uh, three different implementations available. Um, so that is an open, stoke, uh, open source stack available for end node uh, and gateway and network server. So the end node and gateway uh, LoRaWAN stacks are coming from uh, Semtech and uh, the network server stacks are coming from companies like uh, TTN and Chipstack. They publish their whole network server stack onto GitHub, GitHub and they take contributions from outside also, which is very good. So LoRaWAN actually works in a star-based topology where uh, the end nodes will uh, transmit uh, the data to gateway and gateway will relay messages from end nodes to the uh, network server. Actually, the network server is a combination of several components such as uh, network server itself, application server, etc. cetera. Um, so the communication between end node and the gateway happens over LoRa and uh, the communication between the gateway and network server happens over uh, the TCP IP. Um, it should be noted that uh, the LoRaWAN implementation is only available in uh, end node and in the network server. So that is no full-fledged uh, LoRaWAN implementation available in the gateway because that's not necessary. LoRaWAN ga gateway's uh, functionality is pretty limited. It doesn't do any of the uh, handling of packets, but it just forwards packets from end node to the network server and then uh, network server to the end node. So the stack itself running on the gateway is called a packet forwarder, and that's also published by Semtech. 
So this LoRaWAN specification is governed by LoRa Alliance. Um, it is a nonprofit organization consisting of member member companies that who wants to promote the uh, adoption of LoRaWAN worldwide. Okay, so why Zephyr uh, as an autos? Because Zephyr is popular. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, Zephyr is popular. Uh, Zephyr is the uh, small footprint real-time operating system. Uh, one good thing about Zephyr is that it is highly configurable, which means uh, you can strip down most of the uh, unwanted components for your use case and then just use the bare minimum parts required for your end product or um, anything. Uh, so Zephyr was initially uh, uh, started for uh, the uh, microcontroller architecture such as ARM v7, but it got later adapted to uh, several other architectures such as x86, RISC-V, and Extensa. But um, it it's not a microcontroller autos uh, now. It's uh, because it's running on x86, which doesn't have anything to do with microcontrollers. And uh, Zephyr also offers uh, rich functionality, um, like it uh, supports wide variety of uh, uh, wireless protocols such as uh, BLE. Wi-Fi open thread, and it also supports a wide variety of uh, peripherals such as USB display modem, and of course, LoRa. And uh, the true selling point of Zephyr is it is open source and it's uh, governed by a good uh, Zephyr uh, committee. So you'll get the releases in time and then you'll have, there's a, a long-term stable releases as well where the fixes will get backported. And uh, it uses the most permissible Apache 2.2 license, uh, which is uh, pretty good for developing commercial products and uh, for patents, et cetera. Okay, let's look at the current status of LoRa in Zephyr. Um, so LoRa in Zephyr is implemented as a separate driver and uh, we have several APIs for LoRa functionality. Uh, the first one is LoRa config. So this API takes uh, parameters such as uh, the bandwidth, uh, frequency, um, spreading factor, et cetera, and that's used for configuring the LoRa radio. And then we have the uh, LoRa send and receive APIs for sending and receiving the data over uh, LoRa. Um, and then there's a separate API called the LoRa test CW. This is uh, just used for testing purposes. It is It just transmits the uh, continuous radio frequency or of fixed frequency of fixed frequency and at a, a fixed uh, transmission power. So uh, if you want to test your, uh, test the working of your LoRa radio, you just want to use this API without uh, having any of the devices. And uh, the LoRa in Zephyr is uh, working in a point-to-point -point mode. Uh, that means you need to have two LoRa uh, end nodes uh, implemented and they will talk to each other. Uh, that's why we have two sample applications in uh, Zephyr. One is uh, LoRa send and uh, another one is receive. So uh, you need to flash these two sample applications onto two different uh, LoRa end devices and they will send and receive the data uh, over uh, over LoRa. But they don't need any uh, LoRa and gateway in between because it purely works in the P2P mode. Let's look at the status of LoRaWAN. Um, so LoRaWAN in Zephyr is implemented as a separate subsystem, and uh, we do have support for uh, a bunch of APIs. Uh, but the most important ones are uh, LoRaWAN Start, that's uh, used for starting the LoRaWAN stack. Um, and then we have the LoRaWAN Join API. So this one is very similar to the LoRa Join API, uh, where it takes a uh, parameters such as the join modes and then uh, the session keys uh, are the network keys associated with the join mode. And uh, once you have joined the LoRaWAN network using this API, then you can use the LoRaWAN send and uh, LoRaWAN register downlink callback APIs for sending and receiving the data. So the thing about LoRaWAN is that uh, the downlink is uh, asynchronous, which means uh, it, can come in, it can come in at any point of time and uh, we have fixed intervals for the Rx slot. So we cannot predict where, where we, when we can actually receive the downlink from the network server. So that's why we have implemented an uh, API that uh, accepts the callback from application code. And uh, once, uh, once the end node receives any downlink from the uh, gateway, it will uh, call the relevant callback so that the application will get notified with the data. So we have a 
uh, class A sample application uh, running, uh, I mean, in the in kernels of, uh, in the entries of a repository. And uh, that means only class A is tested. Uh, but other classes should also work. It's just that we don't have any uh, sample applications uh, implemented. But I have uh, heard people uh, saying that they have successfully tested class B and uh, class C. So for uh, implementing other classes, you don't need uh, any modifications in the Lodavan stack, but you just need the corresponding uh, uh, sample application. And uh, we support both uplink and downlink uh, as uh, we saw before. And then uh, both OTAA, which is the over the air activation and ABP activation by personalization join methods are supported. Uh, but as like class A, we only have the OTAA join added in the sample application, but uh, ABP's, ABP should also work. And then we also support uh, the uh, adaptive data rate ADR feature uh, defined by LoRaWAN. So this feature will be used by the network server to uh, configure some of the parameters in the end device, such as the uh, spreading factor and uh, the bandwidth uh, that's used for uh, uh, varying the data, data rate of the end device. So that means uh, if your end device is closer to the gateway, uh, the network server can increase the data rate. And if the end device just goes too far from the gateway, it can lower the data rate um, to cover the longer distances, et cetera. And the Zephyr LoRaWAN stack also supports battery level reporting. Uh, that's an interesting feature. It's actually part of the LoRaWAN spec uh, where uh, uh, the end device should uh, implement the, uh, I mean, it should, it should report the uh, uh, battery level of the end device to the network server. And uh, what we have in Zephyr is uh, this uh, API, LoRaWAN SIT battery level callback API. So this API uh, gets the call, uh, function pointer from the application and uh, it uses uh, that uh, callback uh, to retrieve the uh, battery level uh, of the device itself. So the LoRaWAN, the LoRaWAN stack will uh, use that callback for getting the battery level and then it will pass the data to the uh, uh, network server. So if the battery level is not supported or uh, implemented in the end device, uh, the LoRaWAN stack on the end device will just report 255 um, and if the uh, end device is connected to a fixed power source or external power source, not a battery, then it will report zero or otherwise it will report the relevant battery level. And these are all defined by the uh, LoRaWAN specification itself. And we currently based on uh, LoRaWAN specification 1.0.4 and then LoRaWAN regional parameters uh, 2, 1.0.1. And this is uh, following the uh, uh, supported version of a LoRa Mac node repository. And uh, Zephyr actually depends on the LoRa Mac node uh, reference implementation published by uh, Semtech. And whenever the LoRa Mac node repository advances the specification, we also do the same. Okay, let's uh, take a look at the uh, improvements that are being planned for LoRa and LoRaWAN. Um, first one is the uh, persistent storage support. So the LoRaWAN specification, um, it, emphasis the, it emphasis on storing uh, several uh, persistent variables to the non-volatile memory in the end device. Um, so the non-volatile memory could be WP ROM or even a flash, but uh, if you are using the flash memory uh, as the storage, then uh, you need to be cautious of the uh, supported read, uh, write cycles, because usually all the flash uh, memories are limited with the write cycles of 10,000. So uh, if you get exhaust, exhausted, then it will be unusable. So you need to be care careful about that. So that's why I have only listed WP ROM as the uh, supported uh, non-volatile memory. And uh, the parameters that needs to be stored on the non-volatile memory are uh, DevNonce, frame counter, and LoRaWAN server uh, version, etc. And uh, to make our life easier, the LoRaMac node repository has a structure that packs all these parameters. And uh, that uh, and those data can be fetched using this uh, uh, MIB request to the LoRaWAN uh, stack, and we can we can get the data and then we can actually uh, update those uh, parameter values based on the uh, context fetch from the non-volatile memory. Okay, so we know what kind of parameters that needs to be stored onto the non-volatile memory, but 
we need to find when uh, these uh, parameters needs to be stored because uh, that need to that needs to be a time fixed uh, fixed timeline where when where we need to store the data. So I have identified two uh, uh, places where we can store. First one is the MAC process notify callback, and the other one is the PM suspend callback. Um, so the MAC process notify callback uh, is uh, getting called from the uh, interrupts um, uh, from the radio, and then the PM suspend is the uh, Zephyr uh, suspend callback whenever the device goes into the low power mode. And uh, the context will be restored during the power up and during the PM resume callback. So. Uh, for power up, uh, whenever the device boots up, it will try to uh, read. It will try to fetch the uh, stored context from the non-volatile memory. So, um, for cases like uh, uh, in between shutdown of the device, it will be very useful because we don't know when the device will uh, shut down. Uh, so, once the device wakes up, it will try to uh, see uh, if there is any uh, saved context in the non-volatile memory. If there is any, it will retrieve and then use it. And that's the same case with the uh, PM resume as well. So we know what are the parameters that needs to be stored and uh, when these things needs to be stored. But the next question is how these things needs to be stored, right? Um, that's why we are planning to use the Zephyr settings API, uh, which is uh, predominantly created for storing these kind of things. So the settings uh, subsystem in Zephyr is used for st storing the uh, persistent uh, variables to the non-volatile memory. And uh, we want to leverage the same. Um, so currently, Andreas Sandberg, who is our active community developer, has written a work in progress uh, code for uh, persistent storage. Uh, it is still in his private GitHub repository, but uh, in the future, we would like to uh, upstream that support somehow. Okay, so the next uh, feature is the key management. Um, so the LoRaWAN specification also mandates the end device to uh, encrypt the keys and then store them in a, a secure element, which is usually a cryptographic module uh, external to the end device, or it can be part of the end device as well. So the parameters that needs to be encrypted and stored are uh, device address and then the session keys. Um, and uh, as like the persistent storage, LoRaMAC node repository also provides a, a secure element API. And that API is closely tied with the LoRaWAN stack running on the device. So whenever this uh, LoRaWAN stack wants to uh, encrypt a key or if it wants to store the key onto the secure element, it will just call the relevant APIs and then uh, it will be stored. But current, these secure element APIs needs to have an implementation and that's what the uh, secure element drivers are doing. But currently we don't have, uh, in Zephyr, we don't have any uh, secu dedicated secure element driver. So, but uh, we are using the soft SE, uh, also known as soft secure element uh, driver available in the Rodamac node repository for emulating the uh, secure element. Um, so this driver uh, does nothing other than uh, doing the software uh, cryptographic algorithms for uh, encryption and decryption. And then it just stores the uh, uh, relevant keys in the uh, RAM. So it's not good for end product, uh, it, but it's pretty useful for uh, uh, development as well as for testing. And uh, for storing the uh, piece, we would like to leverage the uh, Zephyr's crypto API, and uh, that could be tied uh, with, the, with an external uh, cryptographic module uh, outside of the uh, uh, end node, or it can be built into the end node. That depends upon the SOC we are using. And uh, Andreas also written a um, secure element driver for Zephyr, and that's also in his uh, private GitHub repository. I think he is not getting time for uh, upstreaming this stuff these days, but we would like to do that uh, in the near future, either the same driver or uh, we need to uh, write down a new one. And uh, that's going to happen very soon. Okay. Um, and then the final one is uh, the proposal for uh, adding the native LoRa and LoRaWAN support in Linux kernel. Um, so the first question is why we would like to have this uh, support in place? Because uh, if you currently, if you want to um, integrate any LoRa radio with uh, Linux machine, you need to do that in the user space. And uh, that's pretty nasty because uh, 
you need to have uh, some kind of kernel module like uh, for instance if you are using a spy based lora radio you need to have the spider kernel module loaded and then uh, that will expose a device node to the user space and then the user space can uh, read and write to the uh, device node for talking to the lora radio um, over spy and uh, if you have worked with uh, SPI subsystem and Linux kernel, you would know that the usage of SPIDEV is strongly discouraged by the maintainers. They, uh, they even print a big warning when you try to use it uh, during boot up, I guess. So uh, the kernel maintainers prefers, prefer uh, having the uh, in-kernel SPI drivers for the devices they want to support. So that's why uh, two developers, Andreas and Jian Hong, uh, implemented the Socket API, API for LoRa and LoRaWAN. It's still a in a work in progress mode, but uh, uh, this is their, uh, uh, this is how it looks like actually. So uh, they have implemented a socket API for LoRa and LoRaWAN in kernel. And then uh, they have something called the LoRa 5 layer. And this file layer uh, consists of uh, the device drivers for individual LoRa radios. For instance, if you have a, a LoRa radio such as RAC, uh, RAC 811, and if it uses SPI means, it will have a relevant SPI driver um, uh, in the LoRa PHY layer, and then that will talk to the LoRa radio over SPI bus. And if you have the uh, UART-based LoRa radio, that will talk over SERDEV and uh, as like USB and PCI. So the flow is that the application will use the LoRa socket to talk to the PHY and that will uh, in turn pass the uh, packets to LoRa radio and that will uh, transmit the data to the other end device uh, or the other gateway which is nearby. And uh, if you are using the LoRa WAN socket, the, then it will the request will go to the LoRa WAN MAC, which is a soft MAC implementation. And uh, the LoRa WAN MAC is uh, is, is actually a stack written from scratch. So good job, Jian. And uh, so the request will go, comes to the LoRaWAN Mac stack and then uh, uh, it will go to the LoRa Phi and then finally to the LoRa radio. So if you check uh, the current status of this uh, repository that has all the code of this uh, LoRa and LoRaWAN uh, work, uh, there, needs, there seems to be no update for the past three years. So looks like most likely the effort have stalled. Um, I, I have seen a presentation from Andreas uh, back in 2018 at the Embedded Linux conference, I guess. And um, there were a few mailing list discussions as well, but I think it was not getting enough traction uh, for proceeding, but uh, it would be great to have the uh, effort revive and then uh, uh, finally have the internal LoRa and LoRaWAN support. So let's see who uh, who's up to that. Okay, that's it for the presentation. I think uh, we are open to uh, questions and discussions now. Hey Manny, there are lots of questions popping up in the chat. Uh, do you want to read them off? Um, actually, you might oh, yeah, have to sure. go up quite a way. Um, it started with Stefan. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll go and mute again. Okay, I do see them now. Sorry, I I just didn't open the Matrix chat. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I, I really couldn't stop myself and putting more and more questions there, but we have time, so don't worry. Sure thing. Okay. Okay, is there any Wireshark support for LoRa for debugging development? Um. I don't think so. Um, at least I haven't seen one because uh, um, I don't know. Wireshark is primarily uh, used in Linux, and uh, I haven't really uh, used the uh, in kernel uh, LoRa and LoRaWAN support myself. Uh, just Andreas who did all the work, and it might be uh, good to uh, get in touch with him. But uh, I don't mm -hmm. know this uh, information. I mean, what I primarily used it for is like also on the on the air debugging, right? I mean, even between, for example, two Zephyr devices or something, having like an an host in between and like really sniffing all the things is like really convenient to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. So you need some way of like getting like the, the raw data in. It could be from a Zephyr device, like a specific packet format or something. But I mean, as I understand, Chris, it was like there seems to be at least um, parsing support in, in Wireshark to get all the bits 
as a correct bit in and out. But I mean, there's often a lot more to it, like all the security stuff and so on, if you want to like um, decrypt the session or something like that. But uh, yeah, that's a good question actually, but uh, it will truly help in debugging uh, a lot of issues. That's right. And if it's, uh, if it's a socket implementation in Zephyr, I don't see why not. <laughs> it should work, yeah. Okay, then uh, Drew, uh, what is the class? Sorry. Yeah. Just, um, so what kind of LoRa devices are out there? Is it all like spy-based or is it also something like in USB dongle or something like that? Or is it something yeah. we would need to do our own? So basically the LoRa uh, radio, I'm talking about the uh, radio chipsets from the Semtech or mm -hmm. SBI based ones. But uh, okay. the OEMs take those uh, SPI devices and then they club it with an MCU and then mm -hmm. they turn them into a USB based or PCI based devices. And okay. that's what being done by Rock Wireless or some other companies. Okay, so that, that could be a solution for like having like an, I mean, I just speaking from my experience from like being the maintainer of the 15.4 stack, like it's always really convenient to have something like easily available to just plug into your developer station to, to debug something or just sniff yep. the traffic or something like that. That helps so much. Yeah. Yeah, packet sniffer would be really helpful. And I do see that there are filters in Wireshark. I actually just incidentally had it open right now, like out of, you know, completely. <laughs> incidentally. <laughs> incidentally. Uh, but there's filter, there are filters at least, but a sniffer would be really cool. Yeah. Um, actually, since I'm, on as well. I'll ask my question. Uh, do you know any uh, really great dev boards for end nodes off the top of your head that have Zephyr um, right now? Yes. Uh, the one which I added support is, uh, I think it's called Vistrio. Uh, it's based on the 96 boards for IoT form factor. And uh, you can purchase it from Rack Wireless uh, Store. Um, it's one of the most uh, mostly tested devices I know uh, because uh, that's the that was the first device that uh, got the LoRa support in Zephyr. So and I've been using it for testing. So I would recommend that. And uh, uh, more recently, uh, the chipset from uh, ST Microelectronics, that STM32WL series, it got the native uh, LoRa support as well. And um, if you want, you can also check it out. I don't know when I'm going to get that. Uh, I was supposed to receive one board as a maintainer, but <laughs> I, I didn't get that. Um, okay. So what is a class in LoRa context? Okay, um, class. Uh, so there are three different classes available in LoRa, class A, B, and C, and that, those define how the end node should uh, interact with the uh, uh, network server. So, uh, you have the uh, class A uh, that can, uh, you know, it's based on uh, the timing of uh, send and receive. Like uh, in the class A, you can uh, actually send and receive at uh, some fixed interval, and then that gets improved in the class B, and then that gets more improved in the class C. So it's like in class C, you don't have any uh, fixed time slot for the receiving. It is like whenever the network server wants to contact you, they will they can just uh, send the message and then your end device will receive it. So it's. It's mostly, basically, uh, the classification is for uh, classifying the kind of products being deployed uh, in the LoRa Wang network. Okay, why is the uh, five spec being closed? We would develop the driver against the Mac interface. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. So basically, when I say that uh, the five spec, that that's only the CSS part, that chip spec spectrum, only the modulation part that is being closed. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, you can you don't have the data sheet of the uh, LoRa uh, LoRa radio. Uh, those are all available public. Um, it's just that you don't get any implement implementation details of the uh, exact radio IP okay. inside the uh, chip. Okay, so so basically for like plain driver development, accessing yeah. registers and stuff like that, that exactly. is all there. It's fine, but it's more like whatever software defined radio, you don't have all these things to like make like a compatible uh, device or you have yeah. to reverse engineer. Okay, so that's, that's good. Correct. Are are all chips from Semtech? Is it it's really like only there are some device makers or something and using the silicon from Semtech or is there some other silicon vendor as well? It's only Semtech as far as I know, okay. because uh, they own the, uh, they own the LoRa. Uh, mm -hmm. technology, so they can only produce the chips. I don't think they have outsourced the uh, technology to other companies. Okay. But it's just that all of the OEMs will uh, buy the chips from Semtech and then use it in their products. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
It's nice. And what does the server do with the battery level? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Just so, stay on I mean, here because there are so many. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty useful for uh, knowing the status of your end device, right? But like, let's say that uh, your end device, uh, you have deployed an end device uh, somewhere in a remote area. And uh, from the network server, you would like to monitor the status of the end device when the battery uh, will dry out, etc. And those kind of information can be uh, uh, I mean, it, it's possible uh, that it's mostly used for monitoring the end device and then uh, management of the end device. So if you know the uh, battery level of the end device, that means uh, you'll know the time when it will dry out and then you need to go the go for the maintenance. So, okay, uh, so it's more more maintenance and for the whole network and not, I was wondering if like, if you're going under a specific battery level or something, they would put you into some some sleep mode or something where you like pull every like 10 minutes or one hour or once an hour or something like that. So like a sleepy end device or something like that. So there's no change in terms of like the, the class or network um, management basically based on the battery mm. level. That's really- No, okay. you, cannot control, you cannot control the power management of the end device from network server. So as I said, we, we have the adaptive data rate uh, ADR support uh, that that can be used by the uh, network server for uh, controlling the data rate of the end device, and that's it. You, it cannot control the power management setup, et cetera. Okay, thanks. And uh, Chris, which end node dev boards are? Okay, I think I have uh, answered that. Linux gateways. Uh, so uh, the rack 811 uh, or rack 831, sorry, rack 831 is the gateway which I'm using. It's uh, it's also from Rack Wireless, and uh, if you take Gateway, that's also a, a LoRa radio combined with a single board computer like Raspberry Pi. So uh, as I said in the presentation, uh, the Gateway is uh, just a packet forwarder. It just forwards packets between the uh, end device and then the uh, network server. It doesn't do it doesn't do uh, any uh, packet processing on by itself. So it's uh, it's a pretty simple. So usually the OEMs will uh, take a single board computer like Raspberry Pi, and then uh, they will integrate, uh, they will connect the uh, LoRa radio with it, and then they will use the uh, uh, packet forward, forwarder, uh, um, uh, you know, the repository from Semtech uh, for uh, implementing the gateway, that's it. And then you need to, uh, once the user gets the gateway, he needs to configure it uh, based on the frequency and the data rate um, to match the end device and the network server. Okay, is the Zephyr Crypto API for LoRaWAN implemented at the physical layer or the socket layer? Um, okay, it's implemented at the uh, physical layer. Um, so there is no concept of socket in uh, uh, Zephyr LoRaWAN because uh, uh, that's also a good use case. Actually, I was thinking about doing something like that, using LoRaWAN for uh, transmitting the IP packets. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't be very useful because uh, the MTU of uh, LoRaWAN is pretty much limited and uh, without any fragmentation and... Uh, uh, static header compression. Uh, you want static header compression? Yeah. compression. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, uh, I, I'm not joking. I mean, there is really ITF stuff on going on for like static header compression especially for this kind of scenarios where you have LoRa, where you know, where you know your network topology, right? I mean, you're the, you're sitting as a server in the middle, you know all the different IP addresses, the routes and everything, there's a start topology. So you can, it's so, you can save so much things because you know about it, you have the context for that. So you can have like static header compression and bring down IP version six to like really a few bytes or something. So there's something going on um, on that, that could be interesting if you want I, to run IP I know. Over. There you go. I mean, I know. I actually uh, started working on the static header compression uh, <laughs> support in Zephyr long back, but I I didn't get much time uh, dedicated for that, so it's it got stalled. So, but uh, this uh, static header compression is pretty useful for LoRa as well as for the other uh, um, you know things such as uh, CAN. Uh, I think the CAN maintainer also talked to me, uh, expressing his interest on uh, getting this compression algorithm in place for Zephyr. So it could be really useful, but uh, yeah, let's see. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, okay, couldn't Laura be added to the spy file that uh, Mark recommends uh, for MISC spy devices? Um, well, okay, 
what what does mean the spy file uh, is this the uh, i don't know what that means oh. uh, Okay. I was just wondering, because you had mentioned, you know, there's the warning from Mark about that you oh. can't spy dev. Oh. And I know Mark said in the past is he's recommended people just add their, what they're using to the spy dev.c file. Um, yeah. So it's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the issue is uh, you not only have the spy based LoRa devices, you have USB, PCIe, and then uh, USB based okay. devices. So, um, it's just one of the pain points I, I would like to uh, bring up, but uh, there are a lot more than spies, so that's why uh, we didn't get that route. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. I think yeah, we things discussed, uh, caught back up. when Andreas Farber was uh, uh, giving a presentation, I think in 2019, we had discussed the possibility even of uh, adding socket support to LoRa or LoRaWAN. So do you think that's something that might happen within the next year or is that, does it involve a lot I, of? I don't know. I, I know that uh, Andreas is pretty much occupied because uh, I shared the maintainership with Andreas for the action semi associates in Let's Kernel. So um, he's usually busy, but uh, he was looking for some helping hands um, for this work. Uh, but I think it's there isn't much interest uh, from the vendors like Semtech. I would really like Semtech to collaborate on this work, but uh, that seems to be no interest on this. That's why it got stalled. Uh, you need, I mean, as far as I mean, you, if I go and look uh, search for the socket API in LoRaWAN, so LoRaWAN, we'll get to see only two people uh, talking about these things. So uh, we need to have we need to build a community. But without that, I don't think uh, it'll get merged in any near future. Yeah, so I, I had Andreas and Dian on the um, uh, annually workshop for IoT networking in the NetDev conference. So there has been a little bit of interest, but I think one of um, one thing I, I taught Andreas at that point, and I um, I think that is kind of the problem, is that he's been doing a lot of work, at, but always rebasing it and getting it all on a different tree and keeping it outside instead of like starting small and growing it from there. So I think that was one of the mistakes at that point, it might just get too much to handle and then you just have to stall because you have other things to do. So um, I think the, the stuff he is doing there is, is good and that's a good base to get started. It may just need to be updated or something, but it need to come in, in smaller pieces, basically. I mean, yeah. there is not much interest in the NetDev community, like on the IoT stuff. They are not blocking anything or so. If, if you bring it in and like it's reasonable code and like they're reviewed and there's no no security issues or no like other problems that can get fixed. Um, they are happy to get it in as long as there's a maintainer for it, but it has to come in digestible pieces, I would say. So that is one that's of the really problems that's that, that yeah. stopped. Yeah, you should always start small and then build it bigger. That's my principle for Linux kernel and uh, yeah. I mean, he can, he can have all the stuff he has there like to develop a full use case and like have all the things to like get the API ready and so on. That is great, but still making sure that you're not trying to bring in everything in one go um, because it is just, just too much. Yeah, sure, I agree. That sounds like a really good entry point for kind of uh, newer people who are new to Linux kernel development to jump into something where we really, really desperately need help. And to yeah. get some direction from you know a little sort of a scene. I, I would, uh, it, it's a complex beast, so it's not so easy to like for a new joiner to just get in and say, "Oh, I have a new network subsystem for for NetDev. Just let me do that. I rebase all the things." So that is a bit complicated. There are definitely definitely pieces of it that can be like put out for like a new joiner to like distinct small work items that can be worked on, for sure. But the overall thing needs needs a guiding hand, I would say, who's actually capable of like dealing with the networking maintainers to like, like do that. So, um, yeah, I would, I mean, it would be interesting to, to see that going in. I was really hopeful at the beginning, like a few years back when Andreas was uh, was starting all the work and Gian was joining, but then it was uh, just, just a normal thing that people don't have time. So that's how it is. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> So do we have any more questions? Is there anyone else in, uh, you know, in the internet of people who would like to come on and ask a question? We've got one minute left. Is it it? 
Okay, well, uh, many it sounds, oh, maybe we do? No, okay, that was just uh, <clears throat> Stefan dropping off. But uh, Manny, that was a really great presentation and thanks for, um, uh, I, I think we dropped a few references to supported boards in Zephyr uh, and also the gateway that you mentioned. So that'd be really helpful for our community. And if anyone knows of any uh, sniffers out there that you can just plug into Wireshark, that would also be a really, really great uh, utility for any of the developers that are getting into um, LoRaWAN. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, Manny. Do you have any closing words? Um, no, that's it. Um, and I mean, uh, the uh, both uh, Zephyr as well as the Linux kernel work needs a lot of uh, collaborators. And um, so as discussed, uh, it's not just Andreas, even me, uh, not getting much time in uh, contributing to the Zephyr repository. So um, it would be great to have the uh, uh, people contributing uh, to the code. And uh, as you mentioned, um, it, it's a good base for the newcomers, both in Zephyr, but uh, Linux kernel is too much complex, but they can start with Linux uh, Zephyr. Um, they can uh, start uh, porting uh, uh, radio chipsets to, uh, they can start upstreaming the support for several radios and that's how they can start the uh, uh, open source contribution and then uh, they can uh, be a maintainer one day. So check it out. Excellent. Thanks very much, Manny. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Vaishnav, uh, you're next up to talk about Microbus. Give your video and audio. Hope the connection's okay. Yeah, this uh, is my audio and video. Yeah. One time we'll see. It's one time last year. Yes, yes. How nice are you doing? You. Yes, I'm doing great. Excellent. Okay, well, I'm going to get out of the way here. Uh, so, yeah, um, you have a presenter, and I will mute myself, audio and video. Yeah, thank you. Hey, hello everyone, I'm Vaishnav. I'm a community member and contributor with BeagleBot.org. And I work as a full-time analog engineer with Texas Instruments now. Today I am planning to discuss with you the Microbus Linux kernel driver and the user experience it brings out when it fits into the bigger picture of Beagle Connect. And we'll look into a demo also with the Beagle Connect technology. So what is Microbus? Microbus is an open socket standard from Microelectronica. It's, if you see, it's just a group of UART, SPI, I2C, GPIOs, and PWM analog interrupts, all to bring brought together as a socket standard. And as we can see that this covers almost all of the embedded sensors and which protocols and it brings out a common socket standard and the selling point of microbus is that it's an open standard and anyone can design uh, new add-on boards microbus add-on boards and also add new microbus sockets to their development boards so today almost more than 350 development so board have adopted microbus sockets and and there are more than 1,000 add-on boards coming from sensors to wireless add-on boards from Microelectronica itself. And everyone can make their own add-on boards also, which is on top of this 1,000. And the main focus we are trying to bring here is to uh, a lot large number of these add-on boards already have device driver support in the Linux kernel. So we want to enable this to the user so that they, they need not do the low level firmware development for interfacing with these devices. And now Microelectronica is working on adding EPROMs on these boards, uh, add-on boards, so that the host can read out what add-on board is connected and then probe the device drivers accordingly. The microbus driver is uh, written to do such a function. So, so this is the problem that we are trying to solve. We want to expose microbus as a probable bus. Why microbus? We already discussed that it's 
hugely widely adopted and there are a lot of add-on boards available from microelectronica and from uh, we can also create add-on boards so we want to enable the microbus as a probable bus that means the host can ask what is on the what is connected on the microbus and get some information about the devices let's say if it's a like, so here we have an example of a weather click which has a bmp 280 i square c sensor and so so we need uh, when we need to bring in the device driver support uh, when we need to probe the device driver we need some information about what the device is let's say in this case we need the i square c address of this device then what is the driver like device id of the device and for more complex clicks uh, or more complex add on boards we will have some named gpios named parameters and all and so this information will be stored in a non volatile memory on the add on board and the host can read that information and then probe the device driver so for that we need to introduce a identifier sub standard to describe this information what is needed for a device driver probe so the we have a few, few constraint to describe the like bring, bring out the add on board identifier standard so that is we need to have only the device specific things in the identifier standard and it should be able to describe a wide variety of uh, add on boards so some of the devices will be simple i square c sensors which does not have need much information for a probe and some uh, it varies from the let's say all all the display clicks which need a lot of additional information for probing the for the de correct device driver probe and the first question someone will ask when we say we need to have a new um, board uh, or device identifier standard is why not use the device t source or why not use the device t to describe the uh, devices so why we our problem could not be solved by using the device t or say the device t connector standard is that these microbus ports when we look at it, it it's a group of spy i square c what and initially we think of it as it will all, always be directly attached to the soc but we'll discuss that there can be remote microbus ports that appears over grebus and it it appears as if it was on the host and we want to add these add on board devices on such kind of microbus ports also so our like interest in adding microbus port over grebus uh, made us choose the grebus manifest as the format for describing the add on boards so, grebus manifest already was used to describe the interface and it described only the buses that was uh, connected over grebus or so what we ex extended the grebus manifest to be able to add the device information also on top of the original grebus manifest which only had the peripheral or the bus information so this is a second version of the microbus driver talk we discussed a few items during lpc 2020 and at that time we had discussed a um, draft version of the identifier mechanism and how the grebus manifest got, ex got extended and the custom descriptors added and we had a proposal for adding the microbus ports over grebus and we had a demo so today uh, with the help from microelectronica the microbus identifier mechanism have matured and they are close to releasing a final solution and now we have some uh, good working version of microbus ports which are on a remote control microcontroller and it appears as if it was on the host or grebus and we'll also discuss about the beagle connect it is a revolutionary technology that avoids the need for low level firmware development by making use of the existing device driver support in kernel and uh, have the end user 
use the existing device drivers for the sensors and actuators they are connecting. Finally, we'll go over a demo with the Beagle Connect Freedom Development Board and Pocket Beagle. So what does the microbus driver do in the kernel is that it takes the port specific information. So that is fixed for a particular board, say for a particular board, particular microbus socket, the board specific information is fixed and we describe that over the device tree. So it will have information like RTC, I squared C adapter, S prime master, and also the GPA information and the PWMs and a few pin control state information, etc. And with this information and from uh, we on top of that we get the add-on board information from the non-volatile non memory on the add-on board and we get this information what is required for a driver probe for this particular add-on board and then we combine this information and the microbus driver invokes the driver probe so this is how it happens so for this example we are considering bme 680 device it's a simple i square c device it just needs the i square c address for the device driver probe so the microbus driver also supports other complex uh, uh, devices which have required name gpios and name parameter support also so yeah so this is what we are doing so we take the port information and the board information and we combine that and invoke the driver probe so the experience the user is going to see is if they just plug in the uh, their add-on board on the microbus port they boot up the system and then during the microbus driver port probe it will scan for the eprom and from the eprom it will take this uh, board specific information and we already have this uh, information uh, provider through the device tree overlay and then the device driver is probed. So the user just sees an IAO device uh, appearing on their system once the, uh, they, they plug in a uh, add-on board with the non-volatile memory. Yeah, we see a few questions. Yeah. Yes, money. We are planning to upstream this driver, and yes, we send a few RFC patches, but still, I need to work on cleaning up few things. And yes, we are planning to upstream. And is there any support for hot plug? Yes, uh, but hot plug. These kind of devices does not support electrical hot plug because due to latch up issues. But hot plug just works due to the implementation. We we will discuss later what okay. someone wants okay. and if they risk about if they don't have any issues with the latch up or any other issues happening they can do hot plug and micro driver will support that but hot plug is not the physical electrical hot plug is not what we plan to bring in the, with micro bus driver uh, just a quick question. Uh, so you in the GTS uh, snippet, you mentioned overlay. Uh, so that means yeah. uh, you got the device tree overlay support in place for uh, getting this driver working, right? Yes, yes. You mean the micro bus driver, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so is this dependent on the uh, uh, DT overlay stuff, uh, which is being used in bigger board and uh, Raspberry Pi, or it's a different one? Yes, yes, it's the same DT overlay stuff. But okay. I think it's generic. So, this DT overlay stuff is not uh, upstream yet, right? Because uh, I have a I have a good experience with this thing uh, by working with the 96 boards uh, uh, community, and we tried to get this overlay support added in Linux kernel. Um, it says yes, it's there. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some sort of uh, support is there, but uh, as I said, the, the config FS is the most important part of, uh, you know, uh, doing the runtime configuration of the overlays, etc. So, um, yeah, dynamic cool. overlays, uh, we yeah, might not be supported in all boards, but we don't need dynamic overlay support for this to work because the port information does not change dynamically. And 
say the device whatever add on board we connect dynamically or like the hot plug that does not have any dependency on the device to our link. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So this is the new microbus identifier mechanism which is developed from microelectronica. So they wanted to keep the socket standard constant since it has been widely adopted mm -hmm. across multiple add-on boards and uh, multiple development boards. So they are muxing the chip select line and using an analog mux and the microbus reset pin is used to select between whether to pass the host chip select to the one wire EEPROM IO or from the host chip select to the device chip select. So this is a very simple mechanism in which the host, host can enter the ID mode by just toggling the reset pin Read, read the uh, one wire EEPROM contents and once the EEPROM contents are read and validated, we can prop the corresponding device driver. So at that time, we, we can just change the position of the MUX and the host chip select will be connected to the device chip select. So this is the identifier mechanism. So now what is happening in the, this is the prototype of the script ID adapter. It has a one, one wire EEPROM on board and that's the only thing that's on the board and it's the, it's on the bottom we have the micro, uh, microbus connectors and on top we have the microbus female connectors. So what happens is initially on the microbus port probe, we'll probe the ID EEPROM. During that time, we enter the ID mode that is just toggle the reset pin. And at that time, the chip select will be connected to the uh, one wire EEPROM. And then we uh, register a one wire GPO driver. And from that onwards, the microbus driver's work is done. And the one wire subsystem implements uh, a one wire search, which happens in the background. and that is why I told hot, work, hot plug works in this case. And whenever a one wire device of the particular microbus ID family code is found, it will go to the attached slave device. And we have a, a one wire slave driver for the microbus ID. And from once the microbus EEPROM is found, we will register an uh, NVMM and we will start the EEPROM, read, reading the EEPROM contents. After reading the EEPROM contents, we have the manifest information which we saw earlier and we will validate the information and use that information along with the device tree overlay information to probe the corresponding device driver. So that's all about the microbus ports directly connected on the SOC. So, so that uh, so uh, today I want to talk more about microbus sockets that is not directly on the SOC or let's say the microbus port is on a remote microcontroller and it can be transported to a, the our host Linux system that running Linux and it can appear as if on the system due to the Grebus application protocol. So let's discuss it get an overview of Grebus. So Grebus can be thought of an RPC protocol to con manage and control modules. And it was developed as part of Google's project that has smartphone. So that pro project was dropped. And today in the, uh, in 2019, most of the Grebus core drivers were moved out of staging. And I believe if in coming years, Grebus will be widely adopted in multiple applications. So on a top level, Grebus allows the peripherals on the remote device to appear as if it was on the host through a transport. So let's say if this is a remote microcontroller and it has an I2C spray and GPIO, and it's connected to some peripherals. So and we have a link between the uh, remote microcontroller and the uh, host machine that is running Linux. And through any transport, it can be wired, wireless, or anything, we can 
transport grabus from the so the my, this microcontroller will be running the grabus client or remote device firmware and uh, here in the linux we will have the uh, linux kernel grabus core drivers so so all these i squares say let's say we want to make an i squares read here so this will be converted to a grabus operation it moves to the transport and it reaches the host uh, like read data will reach like this and write operations will go this way so the, finally the end user sees as if the these peripherals were, were directly on this soc so that's where the grabus application is going to be widely adopted for internet of things applications and here in this case we talked about electrical hot plug earlier so the, in that case we are plugging in the add-on board on the microbus soft, physical socket so at that time the host detects the device and props device device so in this kind of a system we can see we can think of hot plug as an event when the this remote uh, device uh, enters the network. Once the device enters the network, Grabus has a uh, in we have a Gra the Grabus manifest for identifying the connected module, and during that time we'll send this information to the uh, SOC. So this can be thought of an, as an hot plug event when looking from a let's say a grabus perspective or microbus perspective and so what we are trying to do is we want say grabus already allows these i square c's by the pio to appear as if it was on the host now what we want to do is let's say we have some add-on boards or the, some sensors connected to this remote microcontroller so we want to probe the device driver which is already present in the host system and interface with this sensor. So we don't need to know what sensor it's connect, connect is connected here or what protocol it or the command uh, what commands uh, accepts. So we just have to prop the device driver here and all the information is already stored in the non-metal volatile memory on the add-on board. So now we need a mechanism to prop the device drivers on top of Grabus created virtual peripherals. So that's where the Microbus ports or Grabus comes in. So Microbus, so Grabus supports all, almost all of the buses that's on the Microbus, like Spy, I square C, U R, P W M, and the PEOs. And so Microbus can be thought of as just an association of these buses. And uh, so it, it can be thought of an wrapper on top of all these buses and we need just need to get all these buses and prop the corresponding device driver for the add-on board connected so this is how this comes into picture so there are a lot of other pieces to the puzzle for running like gray bus on the remote and to the uh, on the whole system, there are a lot of moving pieces. We will just focus on the microbus driver, which assumes that uh, where we already have the Grabus created peripherals, and we just need to pro prop the corresponding device driver. So yeah, so let's uh, the ultimate uh, final user experience the user is going to see is they just plug in the remote system which has a few add-on boards connected with this eprom and once the uh, this uh, remote node is connected to uh, is um, discovered in the network the grabus module uh, identification happens and the manifest is passed to the host and the corresponding buses are created or the, the grabus peripherals are created and on top of that microbus will prop the device drivers so so this is the beagle connect freedom hardware prototype which is in development from the beagleboard.org foundation and this board has a uh, light sensor and, and a few sensors and two microbus ports and wireless connectivity yeah yes chris 
So what you are seeing here is that, so we are probing all the sensors on top of, on the, on the board. And finally the user gets the, say the, here is a light sensor. User can just use the CISFS API and uh, just read the illuminance input from the CISFS files, IAO. So then it's, So the user does not need to know what sensor is connect, uh, connected here and the sensor already talks to the uh, host. Uh, it's already described using the non-volatile memory. And oh, on the physical microbus, we had the luxury of reading the manifest directly from the one-wire EEPROM. So our Grebus, it's not possible to do that. And that is where, why we choose Grebus manifest as the identifier format comes in. So we had to choose the Grebus manifest as an identifier format because we needed to include this uh, add-on board device in information with, uh, within the Grebus uh, uh, module identification mechanism. So the already the Grebus manifest describes what all peripherals are on the remote microcontroller or the remote device. And on top of that, we wanted to describe uh, what all add-on devices are connected to the bus at the, at the same time. So that is why we expand, extended Grebus manifest and choose that as the, uh, the identifier format. So that also makes sure that we only need to maintain a single add-on board identifier information for uh, describing the add-on board. And that single information can be stored on the EEPROM on the board. And it does not depend on how it is connected. It could be connected, di connected directly, plugged, directly plugged into the uh, SOC, like as in case of a pocket beagle, or it could be connected to the uh, a remote microcontroller. So irrespective of how it's connected, we just need to maintain a single add-on board identifier format. So what happens and the sequence of events that happens in the top level is that we have, let's say, or, or initially once we plug in the add-on board on the remote device and turn on, what the device firmware does is it reads tries to read the one by one by reprom directly and stores the manifest information so this board already has a initial manifest that describes a this has a spy this has two i square c bus and a few gpus and all the peripherals are initially uh, described over, over the base manifest we'll call that the base manifest and once we plug in the add-on boards with non-volatile memory, what the firmware does is that it will read the add-on board manifest and it will patch the or overlay the base manifest with add-on board manifest. So initially the base manifest only had information about the peripherals on the remote microcontroller. Now, after reading the prom and we patching the information on top of the base manifest, now the combined manifest will have what all buses or what all peripherals are on the remote microcontroller. And in addition to that, what sensors or what add-on boards are connected to this uh, peripherals. So from there, the host request for the man manifest and the manifest binary is sent. And in the normal Grebus flow, what happens is once the C port peripherals are created, Grebus destroys the manifest. So, but from a microbus purpose perspective, we have some, we require some information from the manifest to prop the device reverse. So in the implementation, what we are doing is we are not, if the particular uh, uh, microbus uh, Grebus class is there, then we do, do not destroy the uh, manifest information immediately. But we just retain it for some more time until the Grebus uh, virtual peripherals are created and uh, we perform the device driver probe on those peripherals. So, uh, uh, Grebus is a very wide uh, application layer and we are only mostly interested in the 
GB5 class of uh, gray bus, which has all these pi i squares, you know, whatever the embedded buses we are interested in. So microbus can be thought of a variant of GB5 class. It does not do anything related to gray bus, but it's just a variant of GB5 in the sense that once the GB5 device has all the virtual controllers created, we prop the uh, add-on board devices on these created controllers. So microbus just do say some things uh, extra to the GB5 class. So that's it implemented within the GB5.c GB5 class. And we just prop the devices. So this is how the microbus appears on the system. So it appears as a device inside the my GB5 device. Yes, now is where I want to talk about Beagle Connect Freedom. Beagle Connect, the Beagle Connect is a revolutionary technology from uh, it's a trademark of Beagle.org Foundation. And the what Beagle Connect aims to do is to actually eliminate all the low level software development for IAOT and IoT applications. And the Beagle Connect uh, plans to do that by shifting the button into the um, Linux kernel. So Linux kernel already has the support for almost a lot of such add-on board devices. Why not have us use that, uh, reuse the, you know, what is already present in the kernel for the remote device and the grapers is the glue that allows us to do that. So, so the Beagle Connect Freedom, the hardware beta program is about to run and anyone interested can contact Jason Kainer from BeagleBot.org and his contact is given here and he would prefer to talk to uh, our call. So now I have a demo to show. Oh, wow, is this a live demo? No, no. So I have a YouTube yep. video. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, got up. Oh, you got it. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. So I I did not get time to add audio to this video. I hope I am audible during this time also. So the hardware we have is a Pocket Beagle, and the Pocket Beagle have a ID EEPROM enabled add-on board connector, which is an OLED display, and uh, the it has a Beagle Connect Freedom connected to its over the USB. And this Beagle Connect Freedom act, acts as a gateway uh, device which runs the WPAN USB firmware, software firmware. And on the host, we have the WPAN USB in this kernel driver running. And this is a remote, this is the remote device and which it has two add-on boards connected. And this is also a Beagle Connect Freedom device. And it has onboard few sensors and also, it has two uh, add-on boards connected. I think it's a weather add-on board, a weather sensor, and a RTC. So this is the terminal on the Pocket Beagle. So let's see what the microbus driver does after startup. So initially, it sets up the pin bug states for entering the ID mode and after that, it props the default one wire EEPROM. And this is for the physical microbus that you see here. So, and after that, it reads the uh, manifest from the uh, one wire EEPROM. And it identifies that it's an FB underscore SSD 1306 OLED device. And we have all the information that is required for the driver prop there. And then the driver is pro propped, and what you can see on the OLED screen is the virtual terminal running. You can see the cursor blinking, and now I am trying to write some text onto the screen from user space.
so let, this is the this is uh, before microbus driver how we used to add the overlay for the oil oled b click or the oled add on board is through the device tree overlay which described all the name gpios all the name parameters like the height width and all and the reset gpios all and we are using the same information for creating the manifest and uh, uh, and the benefit we have is that we can use the same add-on board identifier irrespective of how we connect the device physically or over the Grebus. But the, uh, since today Grebus does not have device tree support, we cannot use a device tree overlay to probe instantiate devices on Grebus created purpose. Now we are going to see the demo for remote uh microbus so the script i what i showed was to probe the necessary drivers and also to set up the wireless connection so now it's uh the the remote devices are even though it, they are kept close together we can achieve a range of more than one kilometer and the it's communicating over sub uh, it's it's not two fifteen point four. So now we are just setting the uh, the pan ID, the, the channel and all, and just pinging the remote device. And we can see that the remote device is online. Now is the interesting thing that happens. So you see that magically two IAO devices, the, the next one, the IAO devices start appearing as soon as we connect the uh, Beagle Connect Freedom remote device now once the the user sees there is that it, it's just as if he plugs in the they plug in the usb so they see the device appearing as soon as they connect this to the network so uh, on the side of the board there are two leds so we are bringing the leds to just to show show that the grabbers is working fine so this so this is the light sensor on the, so we can, with IAO info, we can get all the information about the IAO devices. And this is the light sensor, the weather sensor, and the accelerometer on the remote device. And we can just read as if it was on the host. And we don't even need to know even the name of the device that is connected. If, if you want, just, if it's an accelerometer, just plug in, it identifies itself and it sends the information to the host. We have the kernel driver, and we just use the, the IAO API is so, so standardized that we can even have a same same application program for multiple devices. Let's say from accelerometer, accelerometer to accelerometer, the IAO API remains very constant, and we can reuse the a very simple with very simple uh, user space programs. We can deploy very complex systems. So I am just trying to read the ambient light sensor and just to show that this demo is real time, I am just uh, flashing the light on top of the sensor and you can see the reading is increasing. Mm. And from what I tested, this is the oh, the, the the rate of sensor readings we can get is pretty fast too. So around five hertz, ten hertz readings I have been able to make with different sensors. So this is what is happening in the kernel. So once the interface is added, so the user space to kernel communication is happening over GBridge and the uh, or or netlink and the GB netlink is the driver on the kernel side and GBridge is the user space application which handles this. So you can see that this manifest size, the 420 bytes, is actually a patched manifest. Initially it only had three devices which was default on board and this BME 280 and the RTC, that was patched from the remote device. So if you want to remove and, and connect a new device, it will create a new manifest on the remote device itself and send to the host. You can see also that all the device tri driver probe has happened and you can see initially there was only microbus zero 
which was the physical microbus spot on the pocket beagle and we can see microbus one which is the remote microbus concept which we were discussing so the microbus is kind of the a piece of puzzle that solves it is brings in this kind of user experience there are a lot of movie pieces in the this kind of user experience and microbus is just a piece of puzzles that instantiate the devices on the grabbers we're actually at, at the limit but um I, we're actually i mean this is just going into the break so if you want to keep going that's absolutely fine yeah thank you so I'll, I'll stop after the demo yeah this is an awesome demo by the way yeah so yeah the so zbridge is the user space application that handles the communication between the the grabbers uh, operation messages between the user space and the remote device and the kernel. So this is what all the transactions are happening. So, so whatever say we are blinking daily, this all are happening as grabbers operations, the controller operations and the remote device operations. So yeah, as I told already, GBNet link is what the user space to uh, kernel communication from the GBridge to kernel is happening on GBNet link. So this is a the Zephyr terminal on the remote device. We are just seeing that it has it read the manifest from the click ID adapter, and it read the 120 bytes and from for the weather click then few bytes uh, like 116 bytes for the rtc click and then pass the manifest together with the base manifest of the bb connect freedom and then send it to the host host sees uh, it's a, it has a group of buses which has devices connected Can you share the URL for that, YouTube? Yes, yes, no. Yeah, I'm sending it in the chat. How do I stop sharing this video? Um, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, I yeah, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. It was that was a fantastic demo. Thanks so much, Vaishnav. Uh, I'm just blown away by how much work you've got done since last year. This is incredible. Uh, just out of curious, uh, curiosity, uh, because I know that uh, probably other hardware manufacturers will also want to take advantage of this. Um, the changes that you made for to introduce um, uh, Microbus and um, sort of that um, device meta information, uh, you know, via the overlay and stuff, is that pretty straightforward for someone to also implement if they want to do to do something like the feather board? attached to is that yes yes that is also something that i want to talk so the microbus is just a group of spy i square c uart and gpios pw manual so it does not have any restriction on how these pins are oriented or, or the connector standard so whichever connector standards we have all all these kind of similar bus we can use but i think further is more of a, like more complex kind of system which has more than one i square c or more than one spy on the feather connector so at that cases we will have to kind of create say let's say one feather connector as two microbus or something like that we'll be able to do something and uh, i noticed that you mentioned there in the uh, open problems uh, so i think people have asked me as well on the old Zephyr Slack. Uh, we've actually moved to Discord now. So if you go to chat.zephyrproject.org, I believe it's uh, that's where the Discord is located. Um, but people have been asking for PWM on Graybus 
Uh, and I, I believe in the matrix chat, we've had some people mentioning that um, there needs to be some new maintainership of gray bus and associated tooling uh, outside of the Linux kernel, because obviously the drivers are there already. Um, but we, I think the tool called manifesto and um, I mean, the gray bus for Zephyr maybe, module. Maybe that link, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So who do you think might want to take over maintainership of those projects? Yeah, I don't have a clear idea for that. <laughs> um, yeah. Does anyone have else have any questions? Um, I think you were answering questions as you went, so that was a, you did a great job of that. Um, yeah. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, pretty lively chat on Matrix about gray bus and standards and device tree overlays additional work that needs to get done in the Linux kernel for your changes to finally make it um, complete. Um, Maybe uh, there might be some clarification that we could give around whether or not device tree overlays are needed for this to work. So over Grebus to work device tree overlay we need not have. Let's say I can even run this, all these Grebus, uh, the GBridge, GB Netlink, everything on my host laptop or on my laptop machine, which does not even have a physical microbus. So in that case, we don't need, need to even think about the device tree overlay for the microbus. And this will just work fine. But say when we have a host system which runs Linux and we can connect the uh, add-on boards directly on the port, board, then we describe the uh, uh, port information through device tree overlay. In the other case, we describe the uh, the peripheral or the uh, port information through, through the same manifest which contains device information also. That is why how we extended the manifest. So this both pieces work independently and both pieces work together also in systems like Pocket Beagle, like in the demo we showed, where if we can have uh, the physical microbus and also uh, the remote microbus. So in on, only for the physical microbus, the, which is directly connected to the SOC, we'll need the device tree only. Okay, thanks. That okay. Makes sense. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, I think maybe we got everybody. Uh, I think you've got a couple more slides, no? Yeah, you know, I am finished. All right. Yeah, that was uh, incredibly, uh, that was, that was, it blew me away. I mean, that, that demo was incredible. Um, yeah, it has a lot of moving pieces and microbus is kind of a piece of the puzzle that fits in. Even uh, Stefan, everything. Stefan was saying he just, he was amazed at how it works so well over different wireless technologies and we're using you know 15.4 bluetooth low energy uh and you know like six little pan over those uh, but yeah there's so many different transports that people could do this over as well it's incredible yes you are can be even directly not even be remote also <laughs> yeah um so thanks very much uh i think uh we've actually eaten into the break a little bit so what i might do is uh just put up a little um, I'll probably take maintain, uh, take presenter again and just put up. Um, Thank you, everyone. I'll just leave that there and we'll have a little break and we'll be, we'll be ready to start again in six minutes.
Stefan, what's happening? All good things only. So I guess everybody had some chance to get some caffeine or do some stretching or do a bathroom break or something. So that perfect timing. Really for right. That's a good idea. Um, the other day, uh, yesterday actually, I woke up and all I did was look. You know, I feel like I'm getting older. You know, so all I did. You was are. Like, you are look. getting older. You are then, getting older. My entire right side was just locked up. It just from that <laughs> weird movement and. Uh, Oh, we're not getting any younger. We got to get all this stuff done before. No, no, no. I mean, you have like all the grumpy old colonel people. That's just yeah, the same. Yeah. That's how it is today. We got to start training the younger generation. I do, but my son is still too young to do that. So. Yeah. <laughs> my 13 year old is excited. I think I'm going to bring him to plumbers next year if it's in person. You know. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I really miss the interactive spirit of it. I mean, it's, it's it's not too bad this uh, this assistant, but it's still not the same. Absolutely, uh, Vaishnav, are you still around? Um, I know, actually. Yes, yeah, yes, Chris, I'm here. I wanted to get a um, photo of of each each speaker. So can you uh, turn your video on again? First, I'll get Stefan. Mm -hmm. Stefan, you got to show me a nice smile, and I'll take a screenshot. <laughs> Okay. Jeez, okay. There you go. Okay. Okay, Vaishnav. Did I get you? Oh, no. I guess I should go one of my too, because they're not getting any uh, prettier. I'm just getting old. So. There's Vaishnav. And ready, one, two, three, cheese. All right. Okay, so. Um, Next up, we have Stefan Schmidt, who, as you know, is a um, 15 4 maintainer, uh, quite heavily involved in um, MedDev, uh, Lopan, all those things that are absolutely essential to make IoT work. So uh, here we go. Uh, and uh, I will hand you presenter and go on. So. These are not my slides, right? These are the yeah, just breaks. Um, yeah, I'll I'll set you up here just a second. Um, okay. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so let me give you presenter. Are you All good right. to go? Yeah, okay. that looks good. Okay. So, good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever your time zone is here. Um, yeah, I hope everybody got like a bit of time in the break to like stretch, got some caffeine, so we can start along here. So my session is not really a talk, so it's really more, I mean, I have a few slides, but it's um, more about like discussion here. So at any point, feel free to break in via audio, or I try to monitor the chat as well, or someone just spreading it out or something. That is completely fine. Um, as I said before, I would really love the interactive um, part here to like getting people getting comments or like um, remarks or something like that. So, Okay, so the idea here is um, to talk a little bit about um, the work I've been done over the last few months to, to look into kind of a blueprint, uh, so a product blueprint in the end, not a, not really a product, but just based on all the open source stuff we have um, for an IoT gateway, um, especially with the thread and matter, just like the communication protocols, but also with some other bells and whistles um, can go to that. So starting with the interactive part here. Um, so 30 seconds, name me three things that come to your mind when you hear IoT Gateway. You can do it audio or chat or whatever. <laughs> the year of the Gen's Gateway? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty really, um, uh, proprietary because I always feel like there's Zigbee involved and Zigbee's proprietary. Okay, so that's one, yeah. Well, I have some predicted answers in the next slide, so I'll just keep going. I will see if that, if anything of that matches. Don't be shy, people. Just for more updates. <laughs> okay. So it's a dialogue between me and Chris. It seems. User friendliness. Ooh. Okay. Okay, I think people just need to get moving a bit. 
Okay, so my predicted answers have been like, obviously people will mention connectivity things. You mentioned Zigbee, so that would be one part. Obviously things like Wi-Fi is mostly given. Um, one thing I missed is that quite a few people say, oh, that's another box I have to put in my home. Uh, and most of people say, please, not another one. And then again, as you say, update, most of these things are like turning on and forgetting. I mean, some people even forget in what kind of closet they put them or something. So, and then a few years later, they find devices still still going. So this is the situation we, we basically have right now. Um, if you would have been primed by the, um, by the abstract for my presentation here, you might have mentioned things like OpenThread um, as a connectivity protocol or mentioned something like Meta, which is formerly known as Connected Home or Wi-Fi ship. Um, or you even mentioned things like IP version 6 if you are a little bit more primed and geeky on that part. And you would have said like, keep my devices updated, please. So just setting some motivation here um, and what kind of is driving the blueprint. So what kind of direction we want to go. So the agenda for these uh, 40 minutes um, is like, as I said, it's a discussion session. It's not a talk. Um, the ideas and implementations I mentioned here, that's something I'm working on. It's not too technical um, in terms of the slides or something. I wanted to keep it a bit generic, um, but yeah. So open thread and matter are two open source projects. I'm, I will talk a little bit about what, what they are, how we are using them, if they, why they're interesting and so on. Then in general, going a little bit on IP version six connectivity, not into the guts of, of the protocol itself, but more like how is it used nowadays in contrast to like a few years ago or something. Um, just a little bit touching on Zephyr nodes and also on ATA, OTA um, of their updates basically to make sure these kind of devices stay updated um, without all this kind of interaction from a user that would be required. So setting the context here. Um, from on, on my side, so I'm, I'm working for Huawei Open Source Technology Center. I'm one of their, um, one of their architects. And when talking to different partners, we, the feedback we got that a lot of them in the IT space wanted to get rid of having their own hub. So they really wanted to focus on like the specific IoT device they, they are working on where they see the value and actually getting, getting some money back into the company. And for them, or at least for, for the partners we have been talking with, um, the hub is more of a distraction, and, but just a need they have to bring in as a bundle or something. It's also improving the, the initial cost for someone to, to buy the device, which is also making the barrier higher for people to enter and, and buy the device, basically. So that's also something they would be happy to get rid of to like have a uh, lower entry price and also obviously reduce and the cost to get that all working. So the question really is like, are we able to, to get this zoo of smart IoT hubs um, reduced? Um, so I'm, I'm ignoring completely like any vendor like in or techno, uh, um, stuff like that, branding and so on, really only technology here. So um, we look a little bit of the current landscape and the technologies that are available right now and that are upcoming, or at least that I find are upcoming. There's always more, which is not mentioned here, but that's just the nature of it. So what I'm working on is uh, called All Scenarios OS. Um, it's based on, on Yocto and we are running on, we are building from Yocto, we are building images and applications so on for Linux, as well as for Zephyr. We also have layers for things like free artworks and so integrated, which is not that much used, but so our main focus is uh, Linux and, and Zephyr here. Um, so the, the gateway blueprint I'm looking in right now has, I mean, the usual stuff like having Wi-Fi access point, um, things like headless onboarding is interesting. Like how, how would you do that? Um, the normal thing is like connecting to a soft AP, AP device and then connecting to the existing wireless network, which is possible to do. Maybe not the nicest thing to do. You could do something like um, um, onboarding over BBE or something like that. There have been um, different protocols for that and also some applications. There was some demo application I've been doing with my former company using a progressive web app. 
to use DLE to then onboard um, a device into existing Wi-Fi network, for example. Um, another thing that is part of our blueprint is um, open thread as a border router service. So being a full border router on, on the Linux gateway side and being a normal um, open thread mesh node um, on the Zephyr side, basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking into the basic web UI, which is interestingly really hard to, to find an existing open source project to use that is not really tied to specific hardware or specific ecosystem or something like that. I mean, there are obviously things for, for Raspberry Pi and there are things like for the all um, open WRT things and so on, but all of them are really tied a lot to like the existing system or specific hardware or something like that. So having a really simple UI just for driving an exploit or something is not so easy to find. So one thing we're also working on is like um, system OTAD as an um, system service for running of their updates. I will go into that a little bit deep. Uh, later. And one thing we are not really working on right now, but we have on the agenda, or at least like thinking and brainstorming about is having a way of con containerizing services basically from different product vendors um, to have device specific services. So if you have whatever a specific light bulb from a vendor which needs um, some kind of protocol support or like um, enabling the device to have like the, the back end um, in the cloud, like being provisioned um, from, from the gateway or something like that, or being able to handle the, um, the update mechanism or something like that. Often enough, this is running on the, on the hub from the vendor, but if they want to get rid of that, they need to have maybe have to find a way where they can have like a sandbox application running that could handle these kind of um, scenarios for them. Yeah, and meta protocol support is also something that has been requested quite often. Uh, I will come to that. So um, my brave future prediction. So um, what I think or what I see coming is like the usual bundle of an IoT gadget and a companion hub will, will slowly fade away. We, we see that already. Um, if you see, look at things like the um, <clears throat> the Apple hub or the, this, all these smart speakers having kind of like um, thread enabled devices, for example, that you can bring or some of them even have Zigbee or Z-Wave or something like that. So you will have like different kind of hub devices in your home from a different vendor, which then hopefully be enabled you to run a different IoT device or something. So that is something that could fade away at least the bundling aspect. Um, but we said we will not see like one single IoT gateway for all the devices. I, I don't think that is going to happen. Um, it's just too fragmented or something. It's, it would be a, would be a nice dream to have, but I don't see that happening. One one hope or one brave prediction of mine is like that all kind of networking protocols that are not based on IP or even IP version six will also fade away over time. We have seen that the things like, like Zigbee or something like that, where they also move to using things like IP version 6. And um, there often have been the problem that the MTU sizes of these kind of wireless protocols don't have enough space for it. Then we have seen like header compression coming in, this X6 low and so on. Um, so they are getting technical solutions, getting in there to get that solved. I hope that will go in that direction over time. I mean, there are always like legacy applications and protocols that will stay, um, but over time, I think the future devices or protocols will, will move hopefully to this kind of IP enabled services. And then the not so bold prediction is that there will be mandatory update mechanisms. I mean, there's laws coming in, into place in different countries that actually demand that. So that is not really a prediction that is, that is going to happen. The question is more like how it's going to happen and. Um, how much control we will have over that. So discussion, anything about these context and motivation slides I've been doing so far? I see everybody's like getting really, I really miss the interactive part, I have to say, okay. Am I not enough here? Is, is <laughs> You're yeah, more than enough, but I mean, there's like uh, eight more people in the room. So, no, yeah. I mean, it, it's fine. I, I get it. If, if people don't have any comments or so, um, I just miss it to like have like an audio interactive part. So, 
Go ahead. I definitely agree, though. I, I think that uh, in terms of, you know, having too many boxes, it's exactly the case right now, especially because um, everything is tied all the way up to the cloud, right? So you have a single vendor, you know, end nodes tied to that vendor because they go directly to the vendor's cloud and um, gateways that are tied to the end nodes and the cloud and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what I see is that I guess some of the bigger companies don't mind having the extra hub or having it bundled and even like to see it for like branding value or lock in or something like that. But for the smaller ones, it's really a burden. And it, it also stalls innovation in that case because if you come up with a new IoT gadget or something like that and want to get into the market, you, you have to rely on something that is existing or even or you have to invest all the extra time for like preparing a hub and stuff like that. And so on. that is really quite a burden in, in terms of money and resources and maintenance and so on. So. But you have to see how that works out. So that is just a little bit of like my view on the current landscape and the maybe the future of that. We do so have a right hand right now, Yuval. Uh... Are you able to join us audio video? Yuval is, um, he's actually presenting um, directly after you, but um, he works at Google as well. So he's directly involved in, oh, here we are. Hi, you all. Uh, you're a listener only, I think. I only see headphones here, so I don't oh, think your mic is on. You have to join with uh, your microphone. You wait one second, I guess. That's what's meant. Work. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can. Um, yeah, I was just typing something into the matrix, uh, the chat, because I wasn't sure if you were going to hear me. Uh, I was going to say, I love that you came up, you brought this up, because this has been one of the biggest pain points. And one of the things that I always cringe, when, first of all, start, I always cringe when I hear the word smart home, because I feel like there's absolutely nothing smart about it right now. Um, right? We just basically reinvented the button to be verbal or some other tool. Um, my biggest concern really is right now the uh, the lack of control right so <clears throat> when um i'll tell you my experience working with zephyr right now has been my biggest like trying to push things upstream i have some pull requests that have been pending for uh 60 days right mm -hmm. so as soon as you see, you tell a company oh you're not going to have your own hub we're going to take care of this the user is going to be super happy well, the company is going to say, well, what if I need to push a change? Do I have to wait two months to get it approved, right? If we go into some kind of common shared um, system, and I want to, maybe you can clarify more. I might have misunderstood some aspect of this, but that, that's always been my concern with every time I think, oh, I wish I could only have one hub or no hubs at all because I already have a Google Home with me uh, in my house. You know, would the vendors actually be willing to give up that control? Okay, so the way, as I said, I mean, so for, for these containerized, containerized services, what we have been brainstorming about, there's nothing set in code or something like that. That is just on the on the agenda for like maybe next year or something. We're, we're not just coming to it. But the things we have been brainstorming so far is like, like you said, there are specific services that are tied to devices and that you want to have to keep control over, right? I mean, you need to make sure that the service uh, to your backend is working or that an update is working or something or whatever, just the device specific um, type of code. And for that, we would like to have like a way to have whatever, like an app, app running on the on the gateway basically that would be helping the, um, the IT gadget in your home network to do that, um, to like stay updated. And in that case, you would have the control to like get it updated on the on the device and stuff like that. So that is what we thought would be a good middle ground to approach it. Um, if that really will pan out in the future, we have to see. And that also depends on like how many others are going to adopt it. I mean, I'm not I'm not dreaming that everybody will like have their hubs built on whatever we built right now. That's just not true. Um, but maybe that is a way to like spearheading this kind of concept and then maybe it gets um, part of there are obviously problems with that. I mean, you have like all the privacy issues where you like, 
again have um, control of the vendor in your home, but you already have the device, so that is kind of neglectable. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things that are related to that, um, but that is not too different from having like a companion app running on your phone to control all these kinds of things. So some users are happy with that, some are not. So it is the same situation for them. They could agree to do that or not. So I would always hope that you find um, a way to make the technology workable without the extra service and maybe have that as an optional add-on or something. But we have to see how that works out. So that is at least concept-wise, that is how, how I'm looking at it or how we are looking at it. Yeah, I really hope uh, if you have the time to join my talk, I think it ties very yeah. well to what you're doing. Um, what you're describing sounds a lot like what the nano apps on Context Hub are going to okay, be. Cool. Uh, yeah, um, I, will be, I will be around for the whole session, so I will definitely. Uh, awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to questions on that as well. But it, it, I 100% support what you're doing. It's been one of the biggest pain points that I've been facing with setting up things at home. Okay, great. That's good to hear. Thanks. So I will just go a bit more into the different, as I said, I mean, I'm really happy to have like all those break-ins. Um, that's completely fine. So different discussion topics I have here. So I'm some more, more technical, some are more generic or just, it's all mixed together basically. So um, one of the things we're aiming for is like having also end-to-end -end solutions without any translating proxies or something. So that has been something being used many, many years that you don't have like a direct connection from your from your device to your back end because they didn't speak IP or something like that. So that is all solvable by now. Um, if you say, for example, go with IP version 6 directly from the device to the cloud. If you want to have a cloud backend, if you want to have it like only in your home network or something or to the gateway, which is completely fine, um, that would also work in that case. So and then we have like IP version 6 only solutions coming up. Um, so that is things like OpenStrat, which is based on, on 6.0 and it's in this case only supporting IP version 6. It's not possible to run IP version 4 over the thread, uh, over the link. There are ways to do that, but in general, like it's more like going, going that way. And Meta itself is also uh, based on IP version 6. So that is like the future I, I see coming here. But then obviously with that, you, you have problems, right? I mean, we are struggling with is having IP version 6 at home for a long time. Um, your ISP have to support it or not. Um, you could, if it's working well, you could go with something easy like prefix delegation from the prefix you're getting from your ISP, setting that over to the different, whatever, a mesh network or different IoT subnets or something like that. That could work. If not, if you would have IP version 4 only transit networks, you could like use technologies like Net64 with, with tools like Tiger or Jewel. There's even a talk in the um, in the net uh, net session here at LPC about um, translating IP version four to six without net. I think they're using some um, second uh, uh, stuff that have been integrated in Linuxcon lately. So that that could be interesting as well. And as we discussed right now, um, having like sandboxes for vendor specific code uh, for on the hub for the extra software. Oh, I see there's actually a question from Lucas. Oh, via protocol. So, yeah, I I mean, these are so can and R485. The way I see it, it's like either in a in a home situation where you have like everything wired up in a new house or something or in an office space or something. In that case, it could make sense to have that. Um, I mean, the Unix stuff and so on. Uh, but this is not really on our agenda right now because then from the angle we are coming and looking at it, it's more like um, a situation where, where you don't have that and have everything like set up either wirelessly um, or I mean, because, yeah. So at least, at least that's we are we're looking at it. I mean, it would be nice to have that integrated into these kind of things as well, but I have don't have use case for that. So, I mean, I know that the CAN people are quite active on the, on the Linux side as well, but how much they are thinking about use cases outside of automotive or, or um, avionic or um, ships or tanks or whatever the agra stuff, what they're doing, I don't know. Um, but you're free to join audio wise if you want to like have a discussion with it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, this is me again. Um, uh, I think the wired uh, topic actually touches on as well industrial IoT, right? 
Um, so it's not yeah. always at the home, but sometimes it's about you know quite important uh, processes that need to be monitored and that sort of thing. Yeah. I, uh, okay. I have to say that I might be a bit biased here, coming more from the consume, consumer side of things. So um, take it with a grain of salt. There are definitely use cases for the other ones. Um, and the concepts I'm explaining or talking about are not excluding them. It's just that I'm not really looking at them at the moment. So um, I, I bet a lot of these things could be made made work together with that. So. A little bit of background on the different projects here because not everyone is familiar with them. So OpenThread, um, so Thread is a specification with, um, with a governance body and everything. So um, the spec is available um, in the public, but not the development of the next one and not the members and so on. So you have to be a member to take part in the development of the spec. But the, there's an open source project called OpenThread who's actually implementing that and that is very active and um, is a BSD license. The only thing that's a bit annoying is that you need a um, FNCLA based to contribute to it, but that's how it is for Google projects. Um, they have like implementation for the border router on Linux, and they have open thread like on bare metal and also for different kind of art authors, um, for example, for Zephyr. So what we are using is we are using the open thread integration with Zephyr to have like the client side covered in that case. Um, yeah, so what what we need to do is like do system. So if you want to use that, you need to do like system plumbing for the building configuration and making sure that all the networking stuff is set up correctly. And you are a bit on your own to really verify that it's product and app compatible. Um, I mean, the project itself is certified by the sweat group but you still need to make sure that everything is, is working together. But on the um, altogether, it's really a great project to get thread on your device. Um, be it on a small end node or be it um, on a on a gateway site or something like that. So, next one. So Meta. Um, so Meta is. So as I said before, it's formally known as uh, Connected Home over IP, which was started by the Zigbee Alliance. Um, but then they completely rebranded the alliance as well as the project. So nowadays it's called Connectivity Standards Alliance, CSA, that is former Zigbee, and Matter is former Chip. So if I say something like the old names or something, don't get confused. So that is heavily driven by, by Google, Apple, but also other companies. So it's very active in terms of defining the new specification and so on. They, they have started with a really um, ambitious roadmap, but they delayed it by now. So it's, it's just reality kicking in that these kind of things take time to develop properly. Um, the final spec is work in progress. So this again, uh, spec work is only accessible if you're a member of the Alliance, but um, you can again follow the uh, meta project and there's, um, it's on, on GitHub. I think it's project ship or something still called the repository. Um, where they develop like examples and SDK and so on. And SDK and test events are developed in parallel to the spec. So that is like really speeding up the whole process, giving it a fast pace to, to have something working once the spec is finalized. Connectivity wise, they are aiming for running over Wi Fi and Ethernet and uh, over Thread. So that's the initial targets. Uh, I think BLE would only be there for onboarding commissioning. Um, in the start, but maybe they, they switch to that later. And it's uh, IP version 6 based, as you can see here. Um, and here, like the connectivity standards and so on. It's also an active open source project. Um, I find it kind of hard to, to integrate and work with at the moment. Um, it's really fast moving and context wise, it's really hard if you're not following the, the member discussions and so on, which are behind closed doors uh, to really see what, what's going on in the project and, and see how is it developing. From, for example, just getting it built in, in Yocto is like already like a bit painful. There's a lot of third party libraries and in, in you need to make, make sure that are working correctly and then it's built with GM and so on. And then all the fast pace of things that, that are just breaking. And it, it's just hard at the moment. I hope that will get better towards the end of the year, beginning of next year or something. So the idea is to have like a whole application layer with the data model and device types and using parts of the um, Zigbee cluster library. They are open to all kinds of new device types that are being defined in subgroups and so on. So it's really um, 
yeah, it, that is something where you can really bring in your things and then bring up the commodity level of uh, what kind of things is already um, offered by Matter and then put only your, your secret source on, on top, basically. So that is a bit of like on, on, on the matter side, we don't really have that integrated well right now, as I said, because it's quite hard to do that. So we, we stopped basically at working with the open thread border router, but uh, matters for us is more like a tech preview right now. We are not, not having any real code for that. Let me check if there's anything in the, in the chat here. Mm, okay, that's just ongoing discussion. So, when I, when I talk about IP version 6 only, um, this is like a little bit of like, as I said, I'm a bit biased on that. I, wa I want to see that. I see some projects get, go in that direction, but it's um, not realistic to assume it will go for, for what kind of protocols. So, but if you look at it, like 6 law really paved the way to do that. I mean, before that, nobody ever thought or th thought it was possible to go and put full IP version 6 for the, um, packets into like these kind of allow bandwidth uh, protocols, but this, this is slow, the enabled that, and this enabled things like OpenSwift, for example, or Swift. Um, and we, I mean, we started to see IP version 6 only data centers before on the, on the big cloud uh, providers. And I think to see some more IP version 6 only IT subnets in, in your home, for example, if you have like a threat um, subnet mesh network at home, that would be IP version 6 only. and um, it is still working fine for the user. There should be no no problem or something. Um, yeah, you might see that like isolated in some silos and then migrating over. You obviously would need some transition techniques. I touched on that already, where you have like either um, a net solution or some some other kind of address translation between between IP version four uh, and six. If you have like an IP version four transit network in between. That's basically what I said here. So there are different tools for that. You have like Tiger in user space for NAT604, Joule for um, in kernel implementation, NAT604. There's also an ITF draft from uh, Ted Lemon, I think, um, how you would connect this kind of stub networks to your existing networks and so on. I think that also targets quite a bit of like um, IoT only subnets, which, which have um, IP version 6 only. Let me go on. So, um, before I go to, to updates and so on, OTA, is there any more um, comments, questions on on the connectivity side and protocols I touched upon? Or? Nope. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, as I said before, um, we see laws coming in place where you have to like make sure that your IoT devices are updatable, um, which is really good. I like that. Um, the question is more like how you would implement that and how you can control that to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So we on the um, on scenarios OS side, the approach we are taking is like having a direct OTA approach for like powerful devices, whatever your, your Linux device or something that can make sure that a new new um, image gets downloaded and then flashed into the A or B partition and then reboot it and so on. So you have, if you have enough resources to do all these kind of things and make sure everything is working smoothly. For, for all your tiny Windows sensors or stuff like that, where you maybe struggle to have all the, uh, any resources to actually run the application code, that might be a bit different. So we, we imagine a way to have like assisted OTA from the gateway to make sure that these kind of devices can be updated. Um, that brings me to the point having like different ways of, of doing um, over there updates or gener general updates. It could be like protocol specific. So for example, Meta is looking into um, having OTA as part of the Meta protocol, maybe optional, maybe not. I don't know what the status is on that. Um, then you have application specific, which would be driven by the application even on a small um, MCU based system. And it could be platform specific um, in how we look at it from, from an all scenarios or as perspective. I mean, all of these things could be running on the same gateway. Um, again, with the container, containerized services we would hope to offer, you could have like application specific parts in there or even protocol specific parts. And yeah, we would like to look into the platform side of things. Um, 
questions, comments on that? I'm not going to put on my video, but um, <clears throat> since you, sorry, I'm, I, I don't want to. No, go, go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to have interaction. So. Um, since uh, we were talking about law here uh, in terms of updates and that sort of thing, um, part of the biggest problem with IoT uh, as, it's, as it is right now is that uh, devices can get abandoned by their manufacturer where they don't even work anymore. So uh, at what point do countries make laws to reduce e-waste uh, giving uh, either third parties or uh, consumers directly the uh, ability by law to update their own devices or, or repair their own devices, sort of like the right to repair? Good question. I mean, we, we see that with, with phones as well. I mean, look at all the old Android phones, which only had like not even one update, maybe only the one has been shipped with or something. So that is not a new story. And I think consumers start to look at that and they they want to have it i mean the update thing is just something that they put in place especially for for security for example make sure that we are not running a zombie uh, iot a couple of lots, um, later on but yeah I, I don't know for the right to the pair that might be more difficult to actually uh, go because i mean if you look at all the electronics that don't have any bounding to a cloud connection or something like that 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 the device vendor maybe just have been bankrupt for, for a long time, but these devices are still working. So I think it's more right to repair is one thing. I think it's more about right to run without um, ownership of the company so that I can run my device without the cloud of the company being up and being paid for by the company. But this is getting a bit more like into the political stuff here. Um, let me see if I can finish my slides and then we we have more, more time for all the other questions. So Zephyr and Linux, um, mentioned before, we, we are running both, building both from, from Yocto. So we have um, all the normal um, layers we, we have for our Linux builds, and then we have Meta Zephyr for building um, Zephyr. At the moment, it's, uh, thanks. At the moment, it's 2.6 um, as an LTS. I just heard that Chris said there will be like uh, 2.7 made also by being LTS or something. So we might need to update that at some point. We have to see how that goes. Um, yeah, but we have that for, for all kind of like smaller device MCU based systems basically. And our goal is to have like everything built from one source and then um, deploy it from there. So we're also looking into like sharing various kind of libraries between Linux and Zephyr, which is not easy, but um, for some things it's working, for example, embed TLS is something that could be compiled for both of them. Open thread could be also compiled for the different things. Meta would, would be another one. Um, but the base system is obviously like very different, but yeah, we're also looking maybe into having like the same um, C library or something like that. So that is all up in the air right now, but we want to like bring that more closely together. Um, so you have like a big range of things you can develop for like being coming from MCU base up to like a few gigabytes of Linux based system. Yeah, that's basically uh, what, what I have here. Um, I think there are a few minutes left for more questions. I feel it looked more like a talk in the end than I hoped for, but. Uh, I think what you're doing is pretty amazing though, uh, giving uh, everyone out there blueprints to make devices that, you know, will be supported uh, by, you know, a, a pretty large governing body like the Linux Foundation with Linux and Zephyr. It's pretty awesome. Open I mean, stuff. the blueprints are a lot more, I mean, they are more like tying all these interesting technologies we have in the open source project together and, and building something up that is whatever, 70% or so of a product you can do in the end, which um, level just brings, arises a bay of uh, bay, um, the bar of uh, commodity uh, in terms of software. So that is what we're aiming for. I mean, as you mentioned before, Amit has been talking about that. So there was a talk from Amit in the referee track, I think yesterday. Um, I think he was talking about that a little bit more, especially on Linux and Zephyr, how we anticipate to, to, to that go. I mean, we are still fresh. That is all new stuff. That's, it's not like fully done or anything. We opened up really early to get like feedback and like have this dialogue going on. And so that's the biggest thing we are working on from the OSTC side in Huawei right now. Um, yeah. 
Excellent. Um, yeah, it definitely allows companies to focus on their value add, which I think is, uh, it's really difficult to get wrapped up in all the technical details and just focus on what you need to deliver. Uh, so definitely very, very useful. Uh, yeah. Do we have any questions? Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna look and see if we had any other questions. We have one commenter right now. Go ahead if you like. Yeah, very good question. So from Jerome. Um, so my heart is bleeding in that regard, I have to say. So um, so OpenSwed is not using any of the Ossicron sticks. Um, like 1504, which I'm the, the maintainer of, um, six open stuff, which you also work on a chair with Beely and so on. Um, yeah, they are not using any of these, um, which is um, something I would like to to change, but it's it's really also quite a bit of thought on our side on, on the open source community, like or in our, our case, like the Linux W10 project, because we are just not offering all the things they need to have. Let me let me get to my appendix slides. Did you did anybody see the appendix slides? Because that really ties into that one. So um, for, for this one, so we need would need to have like more functionality on the uh, on the project side on the open source side to actually get anything like that working. We would need have any kind of management uh, protocol support, beacon frames, management frames, and we have a native um, transport to really go that um, we would need to implement all of these kind of things and then offer an API to user space and then have open thread implementing that and going from there. So I've been thinking about that, talking about that with Alex, but it is, someone would need to do that. And I don't have the time or resources to do it. Alex nicer and nobody else is stepping up. So it's hard for me to blame the open thread people. I've been in contact with them for a while um, and they have been interesting, but for them, the focus is also like having this, um, this project that offers all in, in one in out of the box, basically. Um, they have been interested in working together with us, but we also have been failing to deliver the basic needs for them. So there is definitely opportunity to Im improve that, but um, it is always difficult to, to work with this kind of project that have it all bundled together, basically. So um, I, I'm not the biggest fan, for example, maybe that have been uh, seen before that with, with matter and, and open thread using things like GM as a build system that builds all the things together, have like all the third party libraries and like externally pulled in and so on, which is really hard to like integrate well into other existing systems. So um, I would really to see, like to see that um, there, there's a plan we could um, get that working, but it would cost resources and uh, and time to get, get working. So that's basically, uh, I'm pretty sure that if we have something that is working and offering the same API, we could definitely talk to the open thread guys to have an open thread um, native transport. Who would use that is a different question, but it could definitely be implemented technical wise, but it's a, would be a journey to do that. Well, Stefan, thanks so much. Uh, excellent discussion. Uh, yeah, I wonder what will happen by next year for Linux plumbers. There's so much to do, right? Um, My glass ball is uh, not really telling me anything about that. I'm, I'm still wondering if it will be in person or not, um, how yeah. far we can progress with all the projects you're working on. I don't know. We have to see. Okay. Well, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, thanks for having me. Take it, uh, take it over, uh, give it back to Yuval at this point. Um, and I'll set up Yuval's slides. Yeah, I was about to ask, how does this work? <laughs> um, so you've all, uh, I've just loaded your slides and then I'm gonna uh, click on your name and uh, give you presenter status. And I'll go on mute. Uh, but yes, this is you've all for us uh, from Google. Uh, I guess, I mean, please do your own intro. I think uh, this is gonna be a really excellent talk. So I'm looking forward to it. Fine. Um, so I've worked at Google, I've worked at a couple of startups, uh, Magic Leap, uh, Met, Go Meta, and uh, now I'm working on Chrome's EC, the embedded controller, and we're integrating with Zephyr. And while we were doing this, when we first started off, uh, even pitching the idea of Zephyr, I really was excited about the possibility of uh, running Android's context hub, the CHRE. 
And that's what most of this discussion is going to be about. I'm going to blow through a couple of slides real fast uh, to give us as much time as possible for a discussion. Um, please, at the end of any slide, if you have any questions, comments, anything, uh, please raise your hand or say anything. Uh, I'll be happy to address it as we go through. So mostly what I want to get out of this here is I want, I want everyone to voice and kind of be a part of this step to building of getting rid of code or code and processes that we don't like doing and that we end up having to do over and over again. That's basically something we never want to do. So the motivation here is really to reduce the time to market for everything that we build. Um, you know, I know that a lot of us, when we get a deadline, the managers joke, but they are kind of serious. They say everything needs to be done yesterday. Um, it needs to be done correctly and quickly. And the golden rule that I've always followed here is never reinvent something that already exists. And what I want to do is make sure that that something that exists is readily available to everyone. Um, and the basic question we need to ask ourselves whenever we build something is, right, how can we get it to the market as quickly as possible and as reliably as possible? And that, that's a very key feature that I find that a lot of current embedded code doesn't have. If we do a lot of manual testing, but a lot of the code is not very modular. It's not, it doesn't follow any modern uh, test principles. So the a little bit of motivation with pseudocode. So let's talk a little bit about timestamp spreading. If you're reading any sensors, this might look familiar to you or the concept is. Um, let's say that our uh, processor is not fast enough for the sample. So we might get the handler is running and it takes it enough time to where another sample is gonna come in before it's done. Um, in that case, what we usually do is we enable a FIFO on the chip and we read multiple measurements for a single pass. And that works great, except for we need to also know when those measurements came about. We only get the interrupt for the first one, we grab the timestamp, we then have to speculate by looking at the sample rate and then assign a, a sample time for each sample. This is very involved. And this is done in most embedded controllers. And if you're lucky, you get to reuse uh, code that's been written. Well, what if we didn't have to do any of that? What if this was our code, right? What if we just have a start event? We request events. I want accelerometers. And then we just handle the events. That, that's our goal. That, that's where I want to be uh, for basically everything that we build. Uh, there's no reason for any of it to be any further. And Context Hub along with Zephyr really allows us to do this. Previously, if you looked at what the uh, Android's CHRE does, it, you have to implement a lot of things yourself. It gives you a framework for event handling and you don't get to do anything else. It then connects to a bunch of other frameworks, such as sensors in this example. And again, you're responsible for just adhering to a specific uh, API for that framework. And we want to do is create a single implementation of that framework that is configurable through Zephyr and allow developers to basically just use it or contribute to it if you have any improvements. So let's talk a little bit you know, what is Zephyr through a couple of um, quick slides here. Just, a, it's a s embedded RTOS geared towards low power, low, um, uh, sorry, uh, low frequency devices, but it does range quite a bit. You can run it on a lot of different devices. There is a ton of different boards already pre-configured and it's fairly easy to add your own. Uh, we're currently working on integrating into, into Chromium ZC. Now, it uses device tree to specify how everything is connected. So in this example, you can see there's a, a BMI 160 connected at address 68 uh, on the I squared C port zero. Uh, fairly simple to understand, easy to configure, easy to move things around. It also provides common device APIs to abstract the hardware details. So in this example, here we just get the device binding for a label called an Excel. And then we just tell it, I want to get the um, sensor data for the X axis accelerometer. Uh, and notice here, there's no concept of which 
type of chip it is. It might be a BMI 160, could be a 260. There's a you know slew of them, and this code would work on any of them. The device tree is what configures that. So what is the Context Hub? It provides a framework for running nano apps, and this is this is the key. Is we implement the core features of the Context Hub, and then developers can focus just on writing these nano apps. Um, they adhere to simple three APIs, a start, a stop, and a handle event. Everything happens in between is completely your application. And some examples here could be, maybe you want to do a lid angle calculation, right? The nano app would simply require that you have two accelerometers, um, and you would start to request the data for the XYZ axis. On the handle event, you could calculate all of your, um, basically the gravity uh, vectors and then calculate the lid angle. And then you can emit events back into the CHRE. So you can even think of chaining these uh, nano apps together. So one event uh, basically tr sends out the um, lid angle, another one might be triggered by the lid angle. Uh, so we get into these very interesting cases where all of our, co all of our code, all of our features really are modular. Um, and you can think of this as a pub sub effectively. Uh, the nano app uh, subscribes to um, different events that the context hub knows how to provide and then um, the context hub uh, publishes those events. Some of the more advanced features that are currently further down the scope is to uh, support the full features of Context Hub, which allows you to dynamically load, unload, start, and stop nano apps. That means that if you're running in a system where you have larger flash memory, you might have all of your nano apps in there and only load the ones you need right now into, uh, into your runtime. This also provides a great low risk update. Uh, so if you want to update just a feature, you can override just the part of memory that contains your nano app and then reload it. You don't even have to restart your whole application, right? The device doesn't need to reboot. Um, everything just kind of fits together, especially once you've had, you implemented dynamic loading and unloading, which will be handled hopefully completely by us on Zephyr and it'll be uh, up to view the code there. It supports a bunch of different peripherals. They are also called the frameworks. Uh, so you can see these are the current uh, frameworks that are currently supported by the Context Hub, but I'm hoping that once we've hit feature parity, we'd be able to provide a lot more things because Context Hub really only catered to Android up until now. I'm hoping that that will change and that we'll have a lot of new things. And I'll, the last slide I have also goes over uh, different ideas that I've had and things that I would love to see people do with this. So talking a little bit about how it all fits together. Um, and I'll take a quick break after this slide if anyone has any questions. It doesn't, I didn't see any hands being raised or anything. So um, everything uses Zephyr at the bottom of it. We're gonna implement uh, build CHRE and then we're gonna implement the different sensor frameworks um, on top of this. And the, and, and the other frameworks as well, Wi-Fi, GNSS, all these other ones. Uh, are going to go in as well. Now, one of the things that is key here is we no longer have to provide a different implementation per um, per platform. And the reason is because Zephyr abstracts that away with device tree. The only thing that uh, the applications will have to do is provide this custom uh, transport layer. And that is basically the layer that is used to communicate with the application. So you might not be the owner of the nano app. The, app, the format of the packet that comes out of the nano app, which will use uh, nano PB, um, might be slightly different. So the, you can think of this uh, TX layer, which uh, Android calls their host link, is effectively a package wrapper. Uh, you can add your own headers and whatever you need to do to massage the data to fit your application. Now your application doesn't even need to be on the same chip. It could be that the TX layer actually sends it off chip off of a U uh, using a UART and sends it over to a whole nother chip. Um, talked about 
other frameworks that would fit in here that would do the same thing. They would communicate directly with the application code as well as CHRE. There you have Wi-Fi, GNSS, anything else that you can think of uh, will go in here. I'll give you anyone a minute to ask any questions at this point, if you have any. Um, you've all, I'm just kind of curious because you touched on so many different topics here. Um, we've got uh, uh, int inter process communication uh interprocessor communication right um and um that's a very tricky subject because uh, at that point you're involving potentially addressing and sort of, and that sort of thing um so you're proposing to make that entirely application specific then yes so effectively what would happen is the nano app in this case let, let's take uh what we're doing a simple example of with chromium uh, we would have a lid angle calculation. We have an accelerometer on the uh, laptop's base and one on the screen. Uh, those basically get funneled into a net, will get funneled into a nano app that then takes those two and computes uh, an angle. And then that angle is going to be used to wake up the device and also switch between tablet mode and laptop mode. Um, so the host link layer is really the, the the main the primary client I, I oversimplified this drawing but the host link is what gets the message that gets published by the nano app upstream now at this point that host link layer is implemented by the application which in our case is the chromium ec and the host link is going to then uh, basically wrap this with a header and pump this up over a uart to the chip and our uh, kernel is going to know how to parse that, right? So the host link adds a header to the message uh, package and then sends it over the UART. And then we have the same, uh, we're uh, still in discussion of how we're going to uh, package this up, but I'm, I'm heavily leaning towards uh, Pigweed's um, um, gRPC, basically, uh, for this. And uh, so as long as the two ends are symmetric, basically, so you get to write your own host link and the receiving end obviously has its own custom code, and then you can communicate between the two. Well, I was just cu curious. Uh, I, know, I know that a lot of the Zephyr uh, developers and TSC and everybody was really curious. Uh, so is CHRE then also kind of like a message uh, Kind of dispatch system as well yeah and that's what i mentioned in there earlier it's kind of you can think of it as a pub sub okay. system yeah so right the uh, um, nano apps will subscribe to events from chre and then the different frameworks will publish those events and react to the subscriptions and they'll notify both the application and chre of uh, the different events Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, no, please do. I stopped on purpose and, you know, I wanted to make sure. I know I covered a lot there. It was kind of tra a freight train uh, going through, but I want to make sure. What's that? Oh, Stefan, uh, you want to Yeah, so one, one thing I'm struggling a little bit with is like when you introduce like the, the API, this just start, stop, and then um, um, the handle for the events and stuff like that. So, that is the API of the nano app because later on you have here you mentioned things like geofencing, Wi-Fi scanning, and so on. So, how how would this kind of really simple API cover this kind of use cases? Do we have like a, a specific Wi-Fi scanning service, and that would have start, stop, and handle event? Or so we okay? Nice. Yes. So the way it works is you we would use kconfig to uh, basically compile in the different frameworks. So base, eventually there will be a subsystem uploaded to Zephyr for the sensor framework, right? Um, you could, it, it is completely detached from CHRE. You could even use it by itself without CHRE. But if you enable config CHRE and config sensor framework at the same time, they'll be able to talk to each other. Um, and what would happen is, once you've enabled that, uh, you will have access to CHRE APIs that request the sensor data effectively. So I think I'm in, I had a very simple, um, let's see, that's the Zephyr. Um, yeah, so here you have request events. Hmm. Uh, and effectively what you will have is uh, CHRE's API here for requesting events 
and you would pass it the type, which in you know it might be um, uh, GNSS controls or uh, things like that. And you can also make requests to modify the state. So you can even turn on the Wi-Fi or turn off the Wi-Fi chip. Um, and uh, basically, there's a slew of APIs that are available through CHRE to actually control the peripherals. And you would have access to them just by simply enabling the framework, the subsystem using the config. Okay, so basically it's like abstracting the hardware um, per subsystem and then making that available like as a, as a callback interface API, basically where you can just re react on events coming in and things like that. Okay. Right, okay. and the, the, I think the key here really is, you know, I think the, the shoot from the hip uh, reaction, right, should be, well, Zephyr already does this kind of, right, they have drivers that abstract away which chip you're doing. And what we want to do is abstract away some of the more difficult things. And the example I gave, right, is timestamp spreading. And there will be a couple more examples later on the slides, um, more specific to sensors, because that's a little more of my area. Um, but there's a lot of other things, right, even in GNSS and in Wi-Fi, like Wi-Fi scanning, um, there's code involved with that, uh, and CHRE handles that. There's an API for start scan, and you set, give it a callback uh, that will get called with all the different results that you will get. And why would you ever want to implement that yourself? So you're putting basically like default use cases into like the framework to enable that over the existing subsystems to make sure that all these things are available and not need to be implemented in the application. Yeah. Right. And yeah, sorry, Chris, you looks like you're about to say. So, uh, Stefan, that sounds awfully similar to what, uh, I don't know if it's uh, on the way yet, but the uh, 802.15.4 scanning, it's similar to Wi-Fi scanning, exactly the same concept. Uh, where we just return yeah. events of, of detected networks. Yeah, I mean, and the, the, all the all these scanning things are like taking such a long time. So you want to have like an event-driven API for that because I mean, it, it, or Bluetooth as well, it takes such a long time. You don't want to store for like a minute or so. The user doesn't know what's going on. You need to right. see like the progress on events coming in. Sure. There was one more question from Amit in the in the chat. Do you see that, Joel? Let me see about the footprint for CHR. Yeah, um, that's been a, an ongoing question. Uh, and it's hard to tell. I have an ongoing work in progress pull request for CHRE right now. I've been starting to compile more and more of the files in there. Overall, he, here's my take on it in general, right? If you wanted to, what, what I mentioned here before is you could use just the sensor framework without context hub. Right. As soon as you have several applications using basically using in, in the simple case, just sensor framework, multiple clients of the events, such as uh, multiple nano apps. As soon as you have multiple ones of these, you're going to end up having to write your own pub sub system. So, in my opinion, even whatever the number comes out to be, which I will publish on the PR once I have it completely compiled, um, what the different image sizes with and without CHRE enabled. Um, it's it's negligible because you would have had to write that code anyway. Um, if you only have one client for the sensors, just uh, you know enable the K config for the sensor framework only. Don't enable the pub subsystem that is CHRE. Um, so that's kind of my take on how to guide. If someone was to tell me, oh, should my app use this? I would say, well, if you want to use multiple nano apps, then yes, probably you want this because you're going to end up having to implement all of these things yourself. And that is that that is the biggest thing I want to avoid here. That, that is my like shining light, northern light here is please don't write your own code for things that have already been solved. You know, launch your products, enjoy it and see people use it. That That's really what our goal should be. Uh, I also want to just react to, uh, I know that you've had your pull request open for a long time, but we're also right in the stabilization period for, Zimmer, for the LTS. No, uh, no. So apologies for taking so long to be merged, of course. Uh, we have a lot of really interested parties that uh, are reviewing it as well. Um, I know you have more slides, so I'm going to set oh. myself there. Please go where, ahead. Uh, where were we? I think we were on slide 10. Yeah. Okay. So here are some examples I mentioned. I promised some samples. Um, so timestamp spreading, sample rate arbitration, right? So when we have uh, maybe in Chromebooks, right, we might have the uh, second process, the primary processor is running an app that's requesting 
a, sem a specific sample rate from the accelerometer. You, we might have a second app that requests a different sample rate, and then the lid angle calculation is requesting another rate. Again, normally you would have to write this yourself. Now you can basically just have it for free with, um, let's see, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, multiple, yes, definitely. So a lot of these are gonna be, again, timestamp spreading is gonna be a K config. So we'll probably wanna have a, a, a metric for how large that feature is. And each feature will have to kind of keep track of that. Uh, so sample batching, right? So let's say you have a nano app that only cares about, well, I, I want to handle data once I have once I have 10 samples, right? Uh, the sensor framework handles that. The API is already there for that. Um, power management. So maybe I want to uh, turn off all of the sensors except for the accelerometer uh, when the lid is closed. Right, so as soon as the lid closes, I'm gonna go into a low power state and I'm gonna put the accelerometer into the lowest sample rate. That could be automatically configured through the sensor framework. So uh, going back into, I guess, a lot of the questions that everyone's been having is, you know, why, why should they care about this and why, why should they use this? And these are the primary goals. Th these are the things that I wanna focus on when I'm building this and when we all start contributing to this, hopefully one day, um, right? We should aim to reduce, reduce uh, everything basically, and then make it so that you can test every corner and aspect of, um, uh, of your code, of your code. And then also trust that the framework that you're using is well tested. So how far, what, what, what would happen down the line, right? So we're, we talked a little bit about a crystal ball before, and I wanna go into this. This is where I see this going, right? What if we had a nano app that does something like bicycle uh, auto transmissions, right? So you consume power, torque, cadence, and then you emit events basically that connect to drivers that shift gears on a bicycle. You could have completely open source activity tracking. So what if you had a nano app for swimming, for running, for cycling that uh, allowed us to do things on the embedded controller that, no, right, Garmin, that's why Garmin can do a lot of the low power detections that they have. Well, what if we could write it ourselves? What if, what if we can make that writing public so that anyone can build this product? Um, you know, uh, scales, body metrics uh, from impedance, and then going into the real uh, kicker here is, what if we could set up something like NPM that uh, JavaScript has, where you could literally pull in a nano app with a simple command, you know, in, in case of Zephyr West, what if you could have West install um, and you could just pull in a nano app directly into your code without anything that you would have to configure, um, right? And the kind of way I think of it is if we, look at Zephyr as a way to offload the RTOS components. CHRE can be basically offloading the framework for running our uh, features. And a couple of, you know, further readings if you want. Uh, you have these, obviously there is the ongoing issue tracker for CHRE and a work in progress pull request that I'm uh, trying to add in there so I can give the metrics that I promised. And that's all I've got. so please ask any questions. Um, so there was the question of the footprint. Um, I'm just curious, uh, I vaguely recall, I think you had mentioned on possibly the Zephyr uh, developers meeting, uh, is CHRE implemented in C++? Yes, it is implemented in C++. The nano apps do not have to be, right? So all you really need to do is if, well, definitely if you're building using the Zephyr SDK, it already works. Um, I've tested several files and, you know, it definitely uses classes. Now, it doesn't use RTTI. It's completely compatible with all the rules that Zephyr has uh, for that. And I would argue that, honestly, it's, it's, it's a much cleaner system, in my opinion. If you use C++ for some templates and class inheritance, you're really not burning anything and you're gaining a lot of modularity and a lot of code cleanliness. 
for sure, for sure. Even just uh, initialization and, and you know constructors, deconstructors, yeah. deconstructors, I should say. Um, just curious. So um, I I haven't actually reviewed the pull request myself. Um, I'm very curious. So uh, obviously, whenever anybody brings up something like C++ in an embedded system or uh, inside, uh, you know, an operating system image itself, I mean, people always think STL, right? They're like, they're, you know, uh, so, I mean, obviously, you guys are avoiding the STL, right? No, no standard template library, uh, no dynamic memory allocation. It is literally just some templates uh, to make it a little bit easier to reuse code and class inheritance. That, that is really all that's being used in C++ here and it's really for organizational purposes and for testability so that we can create subclass for mocking uh, a module and be able to make sure that everything works well with much ease, much more ease. Have you needed to use any kind of containers or anything like that? Because I know Zephyr does have some um, so sort of basic, you know, dynamic, uh, sorry, doubly linked list, uh, for example, and they have an RB tree, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, um, there are some, basically, so what they've done is actually very cleverly abstract away some of these things. So what Zephyr, or sorry, what CHRE does is they'll create a class, uh, for example, for an atomic int, right? And it has a couple of functions. They're all inline functions and the platform specific implement. So what you are supposed to do is you create a platform specific implementation of it um, that calls down into your platform. Now, this is where it's really great because Zephyr already does the platform abstraction. Um, so we have one implementation and we're done at this point. So you can get CHRE up and running for all the platforms that Zephyr supports just because you know we are, we get one implementation, whereas Android has to, if they swap out the chip, they have to actually build a whole new implementation. Um, so we can really, with, with Zephyr combined, we can really get a head start on here. And I see here a question of why not Rust? Um, I didn't write it. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't really have a great answer. <laughs> it's, I, uh, Rust is, uh, I think there was a whole microconference developed uh, dedicated to Rust uh, at this year's LPC. Um, and sorry, I'm, I don't mean to uh, take all your time here, but um, in terms of, uh, oh yes, uh, so device tree, you guys are using device tree quite heavily, which is yes. great. And I also love the fact that you're using device APIs, right? Uh, because there are a lot of bare metal programmers out there who just do raw register reads and writes, having this great, you know, device abstraction layer is pretty wicked, right? Yeah, definitely. And that, that's that's the core, right? That, that That's using those features is how we'll be able to build a single sensor framework uh, that never has to be updated, whatever chip, whatever sensor, whatever configuration you uh, you end up putting in there. So the, the one question that's for sure going to come at you from the Zephyr community is how well does CHRE run over the network? You know, there are various different types of network topologies. Uh, one aspect that we're really trying to figure out right now is how to automatically configure multiple network interfaces. And I see that answer as being device tree, but would CHRE actually be able to um, operate with multiple nodes in that scenario? I see. Um, I don't have a good answer yet, but I will definitely write it down and take a look. Uh, and you and I can even sync if I have any uh, clarifications on that as I come up with things. Um, you know, right now, again, CHRE was really designed to run the embedded controller of Android, right? Um, we're taking it a step further at first by having just a single implementation that will leverage Zephyr. And then the next step is going to be to probably start adding new frameworks that maybe only weren't relevant for a smartphone, hmm. right? So I don't know, again, like I said, in my example of the bicycle, right, being able to okay, get cadence and things like that is completely new sensors, different APIs that don't exist right now on CHRE. Um, so we're, we're definitely going to push the envelope of what it is. But overall, the great news is the CHRE team is pretty stoked about this. Um, they've already approved a, a change that I sent them to include the Zephyr module uh, YAML. Um, so we can actually include it in our West build already. 
um, and that's the work in progress CL that I have. So they, they've already they, they've approved some changes already upstream uh, to support Zephyr. Oh, that is fantastic. So it was very cool to hear about that. Um, how much time do we have? Oh, we have seven minutes, I think. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, feel free to, uh, you know, bring it up in chat. Uh, we can read the questions from the chat. Or if you want to just pop on with your mic or uh, turn on your video, you'll, you're free to do that as well. Um, pretty, uh, we've got a, a, a lot of interesting people in the room here. Um, I will say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a little more about the network question. And I would assume, again, this is just, again, without doing any research, I'm still on the same screen with you. Um, I would assume that because you're allowed to implement your own host link, that's the TX layer, that as long as we provide maybe a, a, an implementation of a host link that you could use with a kconfig, right? Um, maybe we have here a couple of options or you can have your own custom one. It might very well be possible to do this as a kind of distributed system even, um, that you could even have a remote uh, peripheral that communicates over Wi-Fi into CHRE. I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. That sounds really cool. I've, for the longest time, I've really been looking for that sort of gRPC or something like Apache Thrift, something like that, where it does not only the transport for you, but the encoding and decoding and sets up the stubs at, at both ends. You know, I think that's having that sort of thing, uh, you know, it, it just simplifies so many device transactions, right? Yeah. Um... Oh, I see a question of other pub sub frameworks. Um, so I will say that when I started looking at this, there are a couple of frameworks specific to pub sub uh, that I've seen, but none that catered very well to embedded controllers. I couldn't find actually a single one that specifically catered to embedded controllers that allowed you to um, connect with uh, something like a K config, a simple build configuration option. Uh, to different frameworks, right? So in this example, you would literally just enable config CHRE, config sensor framework, config, um, you know, Wi-Fi framework, and so on and so forth. Um, and, okay, yeah. Uh, and, and so with that in mind, it was kind of an easy choice. It was, I, I spoke to the CHRE team. They were excited about it from the get-go. Um, and the ability to already have these peripheral frameworks integrated with the pub subsystem with a solid API and support from the team that owns it seemed like all wins that it kind of stopped the search at that point. Um, yeah, there was a, there was a joke in, uh, in chat, you know, it's a little bit lighter weight than Dbus, which I would have to agree with. <laughs> Well, uh, we've got three, oh. Jason, Jason of BeagleBoard fame says the kernel socket stuff seems interesting, but too heavy too, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah. And we've got Lucas, uh, another question from Lucas potentially. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope it lives longer than Katie Bus. yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's definitely a, an aspect in Zephyr that's missing right now is the the pub sub uh, mechanism sort of event dispatcher. I know mm -hmm. there are yeah there are a couple of different ways to do it to go about doing that, but uh, I think this sounds very very promising. So I'm hoping that we can get a, a few more eyes on the uh, on the review right now. Um, yeah, please do. It's labeled as a work in progress, so it's not going to show up, you know, in the standard search, I think, uh, for pull requests. But if you go to the issue for CHRE, um, you'll be able to find the link to the pull request there. And I absolutely welcome uh, comments on it as I'm I'm trying to upload every time I add a new dot C, you know, a new uh, compilational unit to it. Um, I try to push, uh, force push it up so that it's up there for everyone to see. Right on. And I bet it's all green too, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. You, um, I haven't looked in a while. I, I know I just uh, we we just released the zero point thirteen point one SDK. 
Right. And today we're going to cut the third release candidate for long-term support. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff happening, and this is definitely the stabilization period. I'm hoping we can get this in for version three. That's really where I'm leaning. Uh, cool. And I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people have already, you've gained support already for a lot of people in the Zephyr community. So Awesome. Um, so, okay, I, I do see a question from Jason here. Uh, we use Zephyr Sensor. So the sensor framework will use the Zephyr Sensor interface, but uh, remember that the framework has to adhere to very specific APIs for CHRE to be able to talk to it. So effectively, it's yet another layer of abstraction that goes on top of it. Um, but yes, effectively, the underlying calls are going to use the Zephyr Sensor uh, device drivers. And then CHRE will talk to the sensor framework, kind of like we said, to, to accomplish common tasks uh, by calling these other um, uh, interfaces. Yeah, well, um, do we have any, um, I think this is slightly off topic, what's happening in Matrix right now. Um, but uh, Yuval, this has been a really great presentation. And I think this is quite exciting. And especially because Google, uh, is one of the, uh, it's, it's got to be the poster child for companies that are, that are releasing uh, Linux-based products. I mean, just the, the, the numbers themselves are astronomical, right? So, I mean, to have products that are based on both Linux and Zephyr out there in the wilds, it's quite, it's, it's going to be a really interesting future, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, I saw one more question for a list of existing nano apps. Uh, so there are a bunch of samples from uh, Android's uh, CHRE repo that you can find. Uh, I don't have the link offhand. Uh, you should be able to easily find it. If you just look up Android CHRE um, code, uh, source code, you'll be able to find the samples in there. And keep in mind that that is not nearly all the nano apps. Think of if you have an Android phone, right? If the camera, for example, doing a double twist turns the camera around, tapping the screen wakes it up, right? The double tap feature, that's all nano apps that are running on the EC. Um, and they're all proprietary right now because they're on you know, the Pixel uh, team. But when we develop upstream, what I'm hoping to have is actually create a, a nano app library in Zephyr and eventually kind of like I mentioned with NPM, have an actual package manager uh, for nano apps that you'd be able to just pull them and have people upload whatever they want into it and you know be the owners and it doesn't have to go into actual proper Zephyr at that point. Um, again, this is way off of using my uh, crystal ball, um, <laughs> but I, I think the potential here is amazing. Um, I agree for sure. So uh, well, I think we're at time and thank you so much for your presentation. Absolutely. Uh, the chatter going on so maybe we'll follow up a little bit in the uh, matrix uh, and next up we have uh, Jonathan Berry uh, from Goliath uh, so again thanks you all it was a pleasure absolutely thank you guys I'm gonna take ownership and or take presenter I should say and let's just change our topic here Let me just double check that I've got, yeah, I'm sure I have Jonathan's talk. No, sorry, sorry folks. This will just be one minute. <laughs> um, oh, here we are, right. Okay, uh, Jonathan, are you available to turn on your camera and audio? I see you there, I see you. I will give you presenter shortly. So Jonathan, uh, maybe I'll do a little, you know, brief mini intro. Um, he, uh, he started Goliath.io, which is uh, an, it's hard, like, I don't know if I can really do it justice but with my description, but um, so they're providing 
hardware solutions and software solutions, sort of hardware co-design solutions. Uh, they're huge backers of the Zephyr real-time operating system. And I've actually been able to take part in the beta program, which has been quite cool. Um, uh, I know that they're using some ESP32 stuff, um, some Bluetooth. Um, uh, Jonathan, how's it going? Are you just about to jump on? I see a mic. How's the video coming? Hey. Oh, is this working? Uh, okay, cool. Uh, cool. I, of course, I tested the platform yesterday and I've used Matrix before, and then, yeah, I messed it up. <laughs> no worries. Uh, that's a pretty wicked mic you have there, eh? Um, uh, one of our engineers is a podcaster, uh, and he, he, he's like, you, you gotta upgrade my friend. So I'm familiar with that engineer. Yeah. 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 So I think, let me just double check here. Uh, yeah, I have given you presenter. Uh, so please just do like a brief introduction uh, for yourself and Goliath and yeah, take it away. I'll just mute myself. Yeah. And I appreciate you doing a little, uh, tap dancing while I was, I was getting the audio working. Um, this is really cool. I'm I'm excited to to be here at Linux Polymers. Um, I've I've watched uh, for the last couple of years, so I'm I'm, I'm stoked to to share. Uh, so the title is it was a little bit clickbaity, um, and in the original uh, description, I had a meme of the why not both, and this is really about my experience and uh, you know just talking with lots of people building embedded systems, uh, which is usually like should I use a Linux or should I use an RTOS. Uh, and really, uh, it depends. That's all good engineering decisions. So uh, we'll get into that. And uh, uh, but before we get too far, uh, a little bit about me. Um, like I mentioned, this is my first time at Linux Plumbers. Let me try to maximize my screen. There we go. Um, my background: uh, I've been in IoT for the last uh, last decade, working on a whole bunch of stuff related to uh, um, IoT systems. That's um, whether it's embedded systems, when I was working at Nest on different protocols like a thread and open thread, um, working on hardware and connectivity and cellular at, at Particle. And um, as Chris was, was um, teeing up, uh, um, I'm currently working on Goliath, which is an IoT platform. Um, we're, not, we're not here to talk about Goliath, but I'll, I'll caveat, my first caveat of, of the morning, uh, I have a lot more experience with RTOSs than Linux. Of course, a Linux user, I've worked on embedded Linux systems, but uh, I got tons of um, I don't know, miles around uh, the track on RTOSs and less on Linux. So a lot of what I'm saying is, is informed by my experience and I'd love to get feedback and, and, and kind of learn from everyone else as well uh, in the process. Um, I think the animation is gonna not come through here, but um, the intention of this talk is not to, you know, Linux versus RTOS. Those, those talks usually don't result in really good, useful discussion, um, but really more about what can Linux in the world of embedded Linux learn from the world of RTOSs, or embedded operating systems, and what can RTOSs learn from Linux? And I'm just gonna go through a bunch of different topics and categories that, that I've used when, when designing um, embedded systems to evaluate if we should use embedded um, Linux or, or RTOSs, um, but also what I'm hearing from our users on Goliath and uh, yeah, general, general uh, insights there. And it's not to say that one is better than the other for a particular use case, just that one is doing something that the other one can adapt from. Okay, enough of the caveats. Um, let's go into the uh, the agenda. So I had a huge list of, of topics. This is two, four, like eight, uh, eight to 10 topics that I have as a, my checklist usually. And there's probably um, four or five more that um, couldn't make it into, into this discussion. And uh, we'll start with the first one as the pattern of how we're gonna go through these topics. You know, you know, what does is, what is Linux do today? What is the state of the art? What does most people have at, at their fingertips when, when choosing to use Linux in an, uh, an embedded system and an IoT uh, application? And then what is uh, the current state of art and RTOSs? And then some personal commentary, just because this is my, uh, mostly my opinion. Um, all right, let's get into the discussion. Um, I'm trying to see, is there, is there a best place for me to keep track of questions, comments, Chris? We, yeah, if you want to answer questions as you go along, that's fine. You can also save it for the end. It's up to you. Uh, as, this is plumber, so I mean, really anything goes. And uh, by all means, let's you know break it down and just get a discussion right away too. That's absolutely fine. Cool. So yeah. If, I... you, if you open the chat tab on the left side, there you see the chat going on. Oh. 
so that, that can, can help you to keep track on questions. That's perfect. That's what I was looking for. Um, I am going to uh, close then my main matrix window because I don't need to have both. Um, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, all right. So let's get into the first the first topic, and um, I encourage everyone to ask questions right away. Um, this is this was designed uh, to be a dialogue um, more than anything. So let's talk about board support. And I'm going to use that in the both the general and specific uh, um, ter um, term of art. Um, one of the things that coming to an embed uh, from from an RTOS is that the actual board support uh, within the Linux ecosystem is way better than in an RTOS. And I'll, I'll break that down further. And in by and large, I attribute this to just the board support packages and DTS and the structured way a a board maintainer, a chipset maintainer, has to introduce let's say support for their, for their particular hardware, and then it's available within Linux. And of course, there's caveats and nuances, but when you compare that to the world of RTOSes, each RTOS has a completely different model of how to describe a board. And from a user's perspective, that may not be a big deal. If you invest heavily in one particular RTOS, then it, once there's support, it's all good. But from a maintainer's perspective, it's actually really hard. And so chipset vendors, module vendors, and board creators, SBCs and others, have to deal with this tangled web of how do I support this RTOS versus that RTOS, what's the how, uh, et cetera. And so there's a lot that can be learned in the world of RTOS is from how, uh, how Linux does it. And then to be fair, there are board specifications and standards that exist. Some of them are uh, bespoke, some of them are more widely adopted. Um, the, the one I reference here is Simsys. This is an ARM specification for those who are not familiar. Uh, it actually is a pretty broad specification. Um, but it uh, allows uh, ARM chipset vendors to uh, adopt uh, a standardized interface for their particular boards. And, and then uh, it means maintaining uh, that board support is a lot lower. Um, it is ARM only. Uh, fortunately, it is open source. So it makes it easy to, to do that board support, like, of course, like, like Linux's board support. Um, but it is uh, it's limited uh, to the ARM, ARM architecture. Now, there's rumors and some um, suggestions that ARM might expand that or try to open it up to other architectures, but for the, by and large, it's an ARM-specific thing. Um, what you actually see more often, and even in RTOSs that support Seamsys, is some sort of bespoke uh, hardware abstraction layer. Um, that's both for defining the shape and the capabilities of a particular chipset architecture, et cetera, but also peripherals, which we'll talk about later on. But the bespoke, um, there's no two um, board definition capabilities def uh, specs between RTOSs, uh, as, as far as I know. Um, each one is, is, is unique, and that causes a lot of uh, complexity and overhead for, for board maintainers. Now, there's one caveat um, with, with specifically Zephyr. And Chris was mentioning in the beginning that uh, we have a special affinity for Zephyr uh, as one, one really capable RTOS. It actually adopts. DTS. Um, so the way you define boards is, is using the, the device tree project. And um, I would attribute a lot of um, Zephyr's adoption and from, from board maintainers and uh, chipset vendors is the fact that they have this framework to define their boards, even though it's different. Like, you know, an, uh, an A7 in Linux is not the same A7 in Zephyr, but it means that that burden of maintenance is a lot lower. Um, so this is the format that I'm going to go through with the rest of these, these categories. Um, I, I think that Linux has a lot to offer in uh, how they go about board support, and then RTOSes can learn and adopt, just like just like Zephyr um, is adopting DTS. So, um, uh, any any feedback, any comments, questions? I'm looking at the uh, matrix chat. Uh, 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 I've recently seen something called NMSS uh, nucleosis, I believe, uh, which is a Risk Five um, kind of chip designer. Uh, and I believe the idea is that they're essentially just taking the ideas learned from CMSS, uh, and that should be integrated at some point into Zephyr. So that that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and actually, um, the CMSS is is a really useful specification uh, because it can be parsed, and so um, this is more than just board support, but 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 actually, it's it's very relevant. Um, other ecosystems that are not RTOSes are using that. Uh, to build their board support. So uh, in the world of, uh, I'm trying to remember the, who started this, uh, Ada. So the Ada programming language, they actually have uh, a parser that parses the XML-based Simsys doc and generates uh, boards, 
be basically DSPs in, in ADA for um, doing ADA embedded. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's ADA. Um, and that was so awesome. The embedded Rust folks did the same thing. And so in, in their world, uh, they actually can leverage for, for ARM architecture by, by being able to, to parse um, and, and basically transpile um, ADA and Rust uh, for packages. And if that was ubiquitous, and every architecture had it, then then um, it, it'd be awesome. I actually recently saw, uh, since, you, since you inspired me uh, to think about alternatives, um, there's a talk at Lenaro Connect, I think, um, of interesting ways of using DTS. Uh, there's a project, there's a tool within it um, that's a parser called Lopper, um, and they're using it to to transpile uh, one uh, one format uh, to D from. D I think it's YAML based into DTS and, and back out. And so other systems can actually uh, um, orchestrate uh, and, and have just a higher level language. I think there's some interesting uh, use cases around uh, the power of DTS that, that gets unlocked when you, when you have a standardized format. I'm really surprised that there hasn't been more support to pursue device tree as an IEEE standard. I know that Apple kind of got, got us most of the way there and there was just interest was abandoned and then suddenly it became really popular again with the Linux community. Uh, I think it started it with uh, Power, uh, with, um, with uh, PA Semi was using it as well. And Apple, of course, acquired them too, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, just an interjection. Yeah, no, and, and actually you and I had a good discussion, I think on Twitter around the origins of SteamSys and the pro progenitor uh, of the specification. Um, there was a lot of uh, interest, um, I think, uh, more in the server, server and, and maybe mainframe world of, of getting something like that. But, but luckily, we had DTS uh, come out on the Linux side. Um, seeing if there's any, there's any questions. No, uh, imagine DTS support in Windows. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, who knows? Uh, it's the year of Linux on the desktop with Windows. Um, I'm, I'm running, I'm running uh, Ubuntu on my machine right now. It's great. Uh, so yeah, technically, um, super curious where, 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 where Windows continues to evolve. Okay. Uh, no other comments, questions, then we'll move on to the next category. These are, these are kind of, um, more general and a uh, low, um, softball, uh, topics and they're going to get more niche and esoteric as we get to the, to the slides. Um, interfaces, peripherals and sensors. Uh, and I'm bucketing a bunch of stuff uh, in, into one, and it comes from the perspective of an application developer. Um, and, and working with a lot of folks trying to, to build their IoT applications, they, they usually focus on this. This is the, the area where their, their, mind, um, their core problem sets are because they're building something in the real world and they either need to interface with a sensor over some interface uh, or talk to a other device over some, some peripheral. So, um, I actually said that uh, Linux has a lot that RTOSes can learn from, and RTOS is a lot that Linux can learn from. And I'm going to try to break this down. I didn't really know how to structure this particular slide. Um, but the fact that Linux has a driver model and a structured driver model is really powerful. It's similar to the, to the, 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 the SOC and the uh, board maintainers, where you kind of implement it once, and regardless of where this is running, it will generally work. And, um, yeah, you know, jokes jokes to be made about uh, audio drivers on Linux, um, but it it's actually a ton more complicated to support different types of um, interface peripherals and sensors in the RTOS world. It goes back to the board support, right, and the lack of something like a SeamSys that's ubiquitous that that goes down to that level. Um, SeamSys does uh, define um, drivers and um, different types of um, peripheral interfaces, but again, uh, not not the commonplace and doesn't apply to everywhere. Um, Stefan has a concept of drivers, and there's things that are not quite drivers, and again, that's that's about as as good as we have. Um, this makes it tough um, portability uh, from both the maintainer's perspective, but also from the end user's perspective. You don't have necessarily a common interface across different um, operating systems that you can rely on, like like a driver, um, or even anything higher level, like like POSIX or standardized interfaces to to talk to. Um, the other thing that that I think Linux does really well and is starting to see um, some adoption um, is these interfaces like like USB and Bluetooth with libUSB and BlueZ and just other types of interface standardized libraries that 
as long as it's there, you just got your USB um, device and you know how it works. And of course, there might be different versions or, or, or whatnot. Those nuances are still there. But compare that to, let's say, a USB stack um, coming from an RTOS, it's, it's been a wild west. Uh, it was maybe five years ago before there was even a USB stack that was common enough that you could say was portable across different, let's say, chipsets. Um, but now there's efforts like tiny USB trying to standardize um, like LibUSB, but for, for RTOS class um, OSs or Nimble, which is a Bluetooth stack that's found in RTOSs. Um, but the, I think the, the state of art for Linux for those, um, those peripherals are, is a lot more mature. Um, and and I, I, hope, uh, I hope RTOSs can also learn from that. Um, I think that one area where Linux can really learn from, from RTOSs is, is just the world of lower level IO interfaces. And that also leads to sensors. Um, and yes, there's SysFS and there's the future version of SysFS, but the, the commonality of low level IO interaction in Linux is only for you know, the, the most advanced developer, honestly. Um, there's abstraction libraries and they, they exist, but compare that to an RTOS, talking to GPIO is the first thing you do and it's built into the entire OS. And every aspect of the OS is, is related to the eventing, the interrupts, the APIs, and the getting started experience. So it's such a core part of programming in, in, uh, on an RTOS, and uh, they, they also generally make that easy. And there's a secondary effect. Uh, the ecosystem around sensors, which are arguably above interfaces peripherals, is so much more richer when it comes to RTOSs and very, very um, spotty at best when it comes to Linux. Um, I think they're related to, to be, to be, to my personal opinion there. Um, but if you take a look, look at the world of Ar Arduino as example, um, for both RTOS and non-RTOS class devices, there is literally a library for every sensor that exists. And because it's pretty easy and standardized the interface to talk to those sensors, um, when Bosch has a new pressure sensor, someone can go in and update the previous pressure sensor library and boom, it, it's now supported. So that lift is, is so much smaller. Um, and uh, I have uh, a lot of hope that that will improve in embedded Linux, um, but there's, there's a lot of patterns to look at uh, when it comes to the world of RTOSs. Um, feedback, thoughts? Anybody has experiences working with anything I, I just mentioned here? Any USB, LibUSB? Are there sensor frameworks that I'm, I'm just uh, a noob to that are commonplace uh, for embedded Linux, or is that left to um, application programming language land? I mean, you have IIO, libIO, stuff like that. So that mm -hmm. is like driving quite a bit of the, the sensor side. I mean, a few years back, it was really, really fragmented. A lot of these drivers have been sitting in MISC and so on, and nobody really wanted to touch them. Sometimes they've been sitting like the I2C system, sometimes SBI. But I think most of these things are going to IO right now. And then you have lib cool. IO on top into that. Cool. Yeah. 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 Um, that, that makes sense of sense. And that that sounds familiar. Um, I, I've most of my experience doing uh, let's say GPIO inter interaction has been in at you know Python, Go, and, and and JavaScript. So someone's dealt with the massaging over the SysFS interface and, and you interact with, but that's that's the thing I think that um, that would really help um, sensor uh, sensor implementers, sensor maintainers, um, and you know people are saying it's actually not that hard to to implement this spy and ITC, but you don't you don't see that proliferation of uh, of device you know, like sensor drivers and, and actuators and whatnot. Um, you know, Jason's commenting on how wild west the Arduino library, and that that is totally true, and I'm I'm not going to uh, disagree with that. Um, but the fact that there is that wild west is is kind of my point, um, that people are actively developing and maintaining those those sensor libraries, and there are other ecosystems, right? Like Embed, for example, has a rich sensor library, and um, Zephyr has a sensor framework, and uh, we're seeing people add more and more sensor frameworks. Um, but um, I think that's that's that to me would be um, very powerful if that if you had the same capability, the same ecosystem, um, on top of uh, in Linux. I'm just reading some comments. Uh, current slides are not available for download for some reason. I, I'm sorry, I uploaded. Uh, I may have done something wrong, but um, I can work with with Chris and. Oh, sorry, that was my keyboard. I had my mic on. Um, yeah, no, I all the slides are uploaded, so. Um, Please keep talking, Jonathan. I'm okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, 
for uh, for sensors where there are quality Arduino libraries, there are link starts. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, uh, what I would love to see is a project that really has a curated uh, set of sensor libraries in Linux. I think that would be, if it doesn't exist, that would be awesome um, and be a huge value for folks working with with uh, sensors on, on Linux. Uh, Lukash asks, is there a reason to drive sensors from user space rather than from kernel? I mean, I can comment a little bit on that. So you, you often see like people want to do like a simple sensor and then they go with SPDEF or something like that, SPIDEF, just to, just to implement the minimum they want to have for their use case. So that's why they often go with like SPIDEF or I2C user space tooling or something like that. Because I mean, getting it into the IO framework into the kernel, it's a bit more work to get it like well integrated before you can actually use the IO or something like that. So I guess that is quite often why you see people coming that way. And you mean you always have to take it into context, like they, they often do the same they would do on an MCU based embedded board or something like that, being more like an electrical engineer and not a software engineer. So yeah. not coming with the abstraction, but more like, okay, I want to have this once, it's zeros, and the, the, basically that, right? So I think that is why they often go the user space way because it's easily accessible. Um, I would hope to be like that getting it yeah, over the time it getting a bit more into the way of using like our abstractive interface to that. But I mean, it's also not easy. Hardware access is one thing, but like having a good framework for sensors, like with a good default abstraction is, is hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, that's probably the, the key that would maybe unlock um, those high quality drivers, um, you know, even, even Zephyr has a sensor framework and there's, there's a whole bunch of work of being, um, going into um, improving that. Um, but when you get to that point, and I would argue that Zephyr's not quite there yet, then the sensor manufacturers are adding it, um, to their backlog. Um, so, you know, Bosch has code on GitHub that is supported by their, you know, FAEs that talks to standardized, uh, packages, um, including a few R tosses. I make sure it's Bosch I'm thinking of, but uh, that becomes something they maintain just like a driver. And if there's really no excuse uh, to, to do that in Linux, then maybe it's just education, maybe some, some high level framework that people agree upon. Um, but yeah, the, the building blocks are, are, are clearly there. Um, I guess a few of the sensors are more targeted to the, to the MCE use case. So they take care of that side, but people, nobody's stopping anyone adding that to a Linux embedded board. It's just yeah, not yeah. supported from the other side. Yeah. And, and there, there's clearly, um, a momentum that is, that needs to happen around this. I shouldn't say clearly, but, uh, when, if there's a state, this is how I'm judging some of these, these suggestions, it's like the state where every sensor board, uh, manufacturer is looking at Arduino, right? Looking at some of the RTOSs that they've partnered with. Um, when we add a new sensor, let's make sure that it's added. We're not quite there um, with, with Linux. And it sounds like maybe there's an opportunity to create knowledge or um, just kind of best practices to, to, to break those false premises as Jason was talking about there. Um, but arg arguably, it sh it should be right. Like you can imagine having the same application um, in a previous role. We built similar applications for um, microcontroller class devices as well as MPU class devices, and that's because uh, the products had sensors in them. And depending on which combination of uh, of IoT devices, this is for consumer uh, smart home, um, we wanted to make sure they had all the same sensors. So we had to implement our sensor logic for you know, collecting the sensor data, for pre-processing the sensor data, basically twice. Now, there was C++ in both places, so we at least had the, the, the core logic um, shared between uh, the, mic the microcontroller class and the Linux class device, but all that device driver maintenance was duplicated. Um, and you can imagine that, that becomes, like, that, can, that can be a lot easier, especially if there's device drivers that just handle it. Um, uh, uh, Nur asks, are there a list of device, devices where Linux has drivers missing? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, that's, that's probably something um, that we would need to put together uh, maybe as a reference. Um, Jason's commenting that uh, Miku Electronica Clickboards uh, is putting together a list. It doesn't have drivers, and he just posted a list. That's awesome. I, I could also imagine 
uh, one has to be compiled manually a little bit, looking at different ecosystems like Arduino and Embed and, and seeing that has the broader um, driver support and uh, to, to fill in the gaps. But yeah, that list looks pretty good from, from Jason. Yeah, and there's there are there are conferences that are all about sensors. They're they're actually kind of fun, um, and you can see the vendors who are there. Uh, if I were to go do this exercise, I would I'd probably go list uh, take a list of all the different types of the sensors I know of and some of the vendors, and just start outputting the the list some somewhere. Um, it's a lot of work though. It's actually a really great way to become familiar with uh, uh, submitting patches to the Linux kernel and other communities as well, because there are so many drivers, so many uh, sorry sensors that are coming out constantly from all the, the various device manufacturers. Um, so I, I know personally, uh, uh, someone who's really not had any of that formal education, there's a big um, kind of push these days. I mean, college in the United States, for example, is incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the big, um, a lot of the big companies are saying, well, if someone has the skills to do the job, we don't need a university education or a college education. Um, and a lot of people might actually just decide not to go that route and just start getting involved. And really, I, I know a couple of people who don't have that formal background, but all they started doing is just writing driver after driver for new sensors that came out and now they've been working at some of the top fortune 500 companies um it's i mean sensors are definitely a good place to start to you know for your first submission sort of thing for the linux kernel that that that's actually a really good uh suggestion i have a few friends who are not computer scientists or from electrical engineers. Um, they actually have other forms of engineering, maybe mechanical or, or some other engineering. But they were at a startup uh, and they were working on, uh, it was a connected device and they had a new, they had a sensor that just didn't work. It was some variant, it was like the previous gen generation of sensor was not recommended for new designs. So they had this new sensor and it wasn't working. So they got in and taught themselves how to you know, twiddle the bits and modify the, the register and it, it just worked. And that uh, got them down this path and now they're a firmware engineer. Um, and so I think that that is a that's a very compelling story, uh, approach to to getting into uh, and getting into Linux. Um, yeah, Nurs Nurs complaining uh, or suggesting it'd be great to know about the new sensors. Um, some of the best ways to learn about new hardware is through the e-commerce portals. Um, so like DigiKey, um, uh, they have uh, DigiKey, Mauser, etc., um, Parnell. They have uh, various things they call MPI or a new product introduction to their store, and they have nice little pieces. So um, you can subscribe to those. Uh, I, I keep a keep an eye on, on for new sensors that way. Um, and uh, if you get deeper into the world of sensors, there, there's a whole it's a whole thing. There's a whole like I said, there's like Sensor Expo uh, um, in California where I'm at, and uh, they have printed magazines about sensors. Um, and Adafruit does a great great series. Um, eye on MPI is one of my favorite ones. Uh, and let's see, uh, I'm going to keep on going, um, but this is, this is awesome. Uh, oh man, there's a lot of buttons flying and the presentation should be downloadable now. Um, oh, something happened with my slides. Oh, sorry. It looked like my slides. My <laughs> slides. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I, I, um, I just got uh, a pointer about how to make all Pretty the, sure you can talk about that as well, right? Not yeah, I have, I have a little bit to say about OpenThread and, and, and Linux WFAN. This is awesome. Okay, I here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Probably not as much as you. Um, cool. Uh, let's, let's uh, I'm missing the controls I had before. The progress. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Um, this is a really good slide. I'm, the conversation was awesome. So, so please keep it up, um, both on Matrix and um, people on the uh, audio. Um, this is another one. Some, some, some might call it a hot topic, um, hot button topic, um, but just real time in general. Uh, I think it goes without saying that real time operating systems uh, focus on real time applications, uh, and and probably probably. Uh, um, have uh, some strategies that can be um, learned in, in Linux. And of course, uh, we all know about the efforts of going into uh, real-time Linux and preemptive uh, RT patches, and there's some updates that, that have been coming out more recently, um, ongoing effort. There's a lot of um, 
I'm trying to remember the word Jason used, um, false, uh, false presumptions about, uh, 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 false premises rather, about embedded uh, uh, real time on Linux. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, real time operating systems have built that into the kernel level. And if you start to, to think, if you go to uh, the, the root of, let's say, um, like something like Zephyr and start trickling up about how they make timing and timing guarantees, just a core part of the high level API. And just like GPIO, just something that is part of your um, experience as a, as a software developer because it's so critical to the design of the system, um, that allows it actually to make it really easy to do somewhat soft uh, real-time or even hard real-time applications with an RTOS and a bit harder with, with embedded Linux. You need a lot more ex expertise in embedded Linux to get that right. Um, you have to understand the, at least the current state of, of where things are and how to really be close to the hardware you're particularly working with, where you can just take a, you know, a, a pretty standard uh, timing-based application uh, with an RTOS and it just kind of works. Um, and I'm all for generalizing that, of course. And so the thing I think that um, Linux can continue to learn from RTOS is how to um, both build that into the system, but then to expose it to uh, application developers. So it becomes, um, let's say, idiomatic from a Linux uh, developer's perspective and easier to be adopted by application developers. I think very specific in my suggestion because that's already happening, to be, to be clear. Um, but uh, this is definitely a strength um, um, in the design of RTOSs. Um, I'll throw on one more thing, which is crossovers. Um, and this is a copyrighted trademark term from NXP. That's an example of a type of architecture where you have an MPU and an, M an MCU, either in a SIP or in a SOC. And I would say that actually on the Linux side, the maintainer, the creators of, of those, those chips has actually put a lot of effort. They have FAEs and software to make it easier to interface between the, the host processor and the microcontroller and offload the timing critical applications. Um, but the RTOSs and the applications that might be running on that um, are not as easy to then interface uh, on the link side. So you actually spend some more time trying to figure out how to, how to create that full application. Um, you know, there, there are certainly uh, chipsets that uh, we all know and love that may have put more effort into it, uh, like, like the BeagleBone and the PRUs, and recently with, um, yeah, the BeagleBone and the PRUs. Uh, but I think that the, that interface between the, the MPU and MCU world is, is, is actually kind of complicated um, from, from the MCU side. Uh, I had another uh, comment here about um, SMP and multi-core architecture. It wasn't quite real time, but I didn't know where to fit in my slides, but I think it's a lot easier on Linux and kind of core to the design. And you see that sometimes being used for offloading um, um, timing critical applications to, let's say, second core, and then SMP helps us um, bridge those together. Any thoughts or feedback on real timeness and the state of real time? I have a little bit of an interest in both uh, the Linux real time and uh, Zephyr real time. Uh, so, I, in a previous, uh, you know, uh, life, uh, you know role. Uh, I was pretty heavily involved in software defined radio and, uh, you know, extremely, extremely high bit rates where you simply just could not rely on software, even in a real time operating system. So at one point we had a lot of, uh, offloaded work right in the FPGA. Um, so that would be an example of, uh, a, a Linux real time host, uh, um, you know, actually in, in picosecond accurate uh, uh, operations synchronized with uh, a device. But of course, um, there is that sort of, you know, what is real time? Uh, there's a lot of answers to that. In, in Zephyr, I know I can speak to this, uh, it's, it's also a soft real time system, but we are able to achieve some hard real time behavior uh, via the use of interrupts for a lot of things. So, for example, the um, the Bluetooth uh, stack that is inside of Zephyr, uh, originally contributed by um, Nordic, now used by Nordic, um, NXP, uh, probably others, uh, that uses a hard real-time approach to solving that problem where everything is interrupt-driven, uh, either via timer or I.O. or whatever. Um, but Zephyr would actually make a really great choice for offloading now. And I think that um, the we're getting there in terms of that 
you know, RTOS to OS messaging. I think that's coming along as well. So just thought I'd add that um, because this is a, an area which, which I consider quite important. Yeah, and and also quite complicated. Uh, you know, the the picosecond latency that's 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 real. That's real, real world applications. It's not you know niche, academic only oriented ones. I think both both uh, both domains still haven't had a good answer, which is why for the longest time, <clears throat> most well, we socks the 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 RF modem was an ASIC, right? Because you couldn't really do software defined if you want to get that timing. Um, also cost, but uh, in general, um, yeah, that's that's great. Great points. Okay. Any other comments? I will I'll keep on going, but we can always go back. Um, <clears throat> all right. And this one um, is also really important, and that's the way application developers program in the programming language support. Uh, and I felt like this was was worth calling out just because it's so tough today in 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 our toss land to have um, choice in more accessible languages to more people. And this is just in the total wheelhouse of Linux, right? If, you, if you're having an extremely constrained Linux environment, you could still just take pretty much any programming language that can run on Linux, which is all of them that I know of, uh, and use it as your application uh, language. So you don't have to be in C or C++ for, for everything. Um, and of course, if you have more resources, then you can even be using things that have huge garbage collection capabilities like Java and Node. Um, it also means that you can leverage language package managers, which is a huge deal for language nerds uh, or, or just the average user. Uh, so you can reuse code that exists, but also continually to expand your capabilities and not have to worry about, uh, worry about uh, bundling everything together. Um, also, some people use this as part of their software update story, um, which we'll get into in a, in a hot minute. Um, but because of Linux and the support for different architectures and languages support, you can use that language on different chipsets on Linux because of, you know they support x86, ARM, and, and RISC-V, which is the three most common we see these days. Um, on the other hand, our tosses have a lot to learn. Um, and this could be the nature of the, the types of devices they target that are resource constrained. So they can't just take the standard language and so you see these variants of you know, Python as MicroPython and JerryScript as, uh, as JavaScript, which are super hand-tuned, sometimes a subset of languages, but that means you basically only get the benefit of the language itself, but none of the ecosystem. So you can't use PyPy. You can't, you, you can't go on the python.org site and get the, the API documentation, because it might be different. And so while that work, it, it does work and it's capable and it has opened up programming and building applications on in the worlds of RTOS, it's still, complicated and it's hard and there's not a lot of reuse. Um, I, I threw in WebAssembly this is one of my areas of interest because because uh, my friends and I play around with WebAssembly on, on, on devices to get more language support. But it's it's just there's so much to be um, to be learned from the world of, of Linux. Um, and yeah of course Rust can do bare metal. Rust is probably the only language I know of uh, that has a working group dedicated to uh, embedded um, and we would love if you could just take the same language and run it, whether it's in a Linux or an RTOS environment, but it, it's just not the case today. Um, there, there is uh, also TinyGo, which is, which is great for Go developers, but again, it's a fork of Go effectively, um, limited in, in cap capacity. And it just means that less people can program and build applications using, using an RTOS. Um, some comments about real time, time slots. Uh, yeah, it's pretty awkward. Uh, I agree. Um, any any other comments, feedback? I imagine a lot of people uh, are C++ developers are watching this. Um, this is not a problem. But as you scale your application and have different uh, larger organizations, it's actually a huge problem. Um, you want to have all your C++ developers working on kernel and drivers and um, you know machine learning algorithms. Well, your end user application engineers, you know they. It's harder, to hi hard, harder and harder to hire a whole big team of C++ developers. They would love to have, um, you know, let's say, higher le level languages. Anyway, I'm going to skip this one or continue uh, moving on. Um, distros. And I was squeamish when I was typing this one. Um, but I I'm going to explain what I mean and why this is uh, um, awesome for building on Linux and something that is missing in the world of RTOS. Um, a distro 
is really this packaged solution around a flavor of Linux. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why this is awesome. One is because of shared code. So Raspbian and, and Ubuntu, Debian-based, right? The things that go into Debian um, may, mean that those two distros um, have a lot of shared code. This is from a, a capabilities maintainer's perspective. But from an application developer's perspective, that means you can take your application and move between different distros. There's a lot of portability um, as a result, even for a highly constrained embedded Linux system. Um, and uh, that is a huge boom, especially if you change um, kernel, you know, architecture and, and whatnot. Um, because there's these distros that are well-defined and um, used by many people, um, there's a lot of learning resources. So the nuances between Arch and, and uh, uh, Ubuntu's Canonical, um, you can find that out. And you can become experts on uh, one distro versus the other. And um, as a result, there's a lot of professional support. So even if you're building it yourself for your company, you can go off and hire consultants, whether they're from the companies who maintain distros or just experts who contribute upstream and have built domain knowledge. You, you can pay someone for help. There's less and less of that in RTOS. And I kind of make this case that, because there's not really distros in the same sense. Um, now, there are proprietary RTOSs that feel like a distro, right? Have some of the same capabilities. You can go to a um, uh, RTOS vendor and they can give you support and they can give you a, a knowledge and training, et cetera. Um, but you certainly don't have any of the portability between those proprietary um, RTOSs. Um, there's no packaged release that's, that's like, a, like a version. Um, it feels like you're actually using Linux and saying, OK, we're, we're, we're dealing with a kernel. And everything above it is up to you as the application developer to create your own distribution, which is, is fine, but that that's, that's, doesn't have a lot of these benefits. Um, and it's worth calling out that uh, certain RTOSs have what I call um, sponsorship. So there's free RTOS. Uh, when AWS, which uh, maintains uh, the FreeRTOS project as AWS FreeRTOS, and they sponsor uh, uh, and maintain that that's particular distribution. Um, and there's a couple other examples um, of, of companies doing that. Um, but the, it's not as ubiquitous and makes means it's harder for a lot of companies to snap to a distribution and its distribution release. And uh, yeah, I think it, it makes it comp more complicated to, 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 pick an art, to pick a distribution to, to tie to. Well, that's one comment from my side again. Um, mm -hmm. It's always me. Um, so in my, in my talk, I touched briefly touched on that. So in the all scenarios OS project I'm working on, we we are working on parts of this problem. So we are building um, images from from Yocto for both for Linux and Sapphire. We also have like um, I mean basically we are leveraging what uh, what is what kind of layers are existing for Yocto here. So Meta, Zephyr, Meta, Free Artos, and so on. So, but that is only the building part, right? That is still quite separated in terms of application and whatever graphical stack and so on, what you might run on top. We are trying to look into all kinds of pieces for there. So I mentioned before that we are looking into like using Embed TLS on both of them, the same version. Yep, yep. Um, for our use case, also things like open thread or matter is like something we want to reuse, but that's more, that's not like general, that's like really use case specific, but there, there are maybe other things. So we also, um, one of the research things we are doing is like checking if LVGL as a graphical um, mm -hmm. UI kit is capable of like, it's good enough on the Linux side as well as on the Zephyr side to like, um, have like this, at least the same code for this kind of applications. I mean, there's still a lot of work to do, but there's progress in that regard because we see the same use cases. We see like the the world is getting so complex that they you want to choose like MCU or um, CPU based systems and not like go into a complete different distro or, or build system there. So that's what we are doing with that side. There's also a talk from Amit yesterday. You might want to see the recording for that on on our approach, like checking Linux and Sapphire. Just a comment. Oh, and he so, just. just just posted that. And yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. looking forward to, to catching up on, on, the, on that talk. Um, yeah, and, and that's the point. It's, it's complexity. So from a commercial perspective, having a distro is awesome, right? Like you can say, here's our commercial support. Here's what we're tying to. Here's all the dependencies. Um, we'll get into security, but there's like a lot of stuff there. Um, and that's, that I'm also looking forward to, to watching your talk about it because I think that's needed. Um, as a, you know, as example, you mentioned Yocto and, and building tool chains. Um, the Zephyr project is actually looking to evolve their SDKs, at least to have some more of that um, hermetic uh, 
uh, deploy um, builds of SDKs, which I think is, is is a step in the right direction. On the same, yeah, I mean, I remember the years where we had like the, all this kind of different outdated tool chains for like just a specific MCU based system, or even like an ARM based system or something where you had like in GCC whatever four point X or something. So it's really great to see that nowadays that it's not normally the case that you normally can just build with the latest tool chains, either for MCU or CPU systems. So that's good. On the topic of professional support, since it's been available for Linux for a quite a long time, uh, recently there have been some Zephyr users that have gone on to, previously we're on Slack, now we're at uh, Discord. Um, so you can just, I think it's just uh, 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 chat.zephyrproject.org, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that'll bring you right there. But uh, for the Zephyr project, we've had some end users come on and say, who can I hire to provide training uh, for you know, building Zephyr applications and you know, providing BSPs for Zephyr? And uh, I believe the technical uh, steering committee will is going to be addressing that soon because there's an immediate need for it. Um, Zephyr is really easy to use once you're familiar with it, but it takes a little bit of time to get used to it. If you're already familiar with Linux, it's no problem, but um, a lot of newcomers uh, don't really tie that uh, device tree, uh, you know, device get binding to sort of like opening a device in Linux type thing in the user space. Um, so there, there are definitely opportunities even for training for Zephyr. Uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, de um, definitely a huge opportunity uh, from coming, putting on my Zephyr marketing hat. Uh, to to do what we have in you know embedded Linux Yocto build root right like you can go through our training program you can um, uh, see all the, the different systems people use and how they use it and that's that's pretty nascent in, in the world of RTOS is primarily because it's such a you know uh, newish to have open and free RTOS is to, to be to be fair um, looks like I am only halfway done with my slides uh, and we're at uh, over time, I don't know how we're doing on, on the schedule. Are you behind, ahead? We've actually got five minutes right now, uh, so we're okay. doing fine. And I think the discussion here is wonderful, so uh, we're probably not in a huge rush to end right on time. Uh, if you want to keep the discussion going, that's that's fine as well. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll at least try it for five more minutes to see uh, if we have any more interesting topics um, or discussions from these topics. Uh, I actually had five slides for this. I'm, I'm trying to compress these all into one. Um, but software updates, and this is uh, you know putting my Goliath hat on. This is an area that we spend a lot of our effort on. Um, it's it's actually surprisingly bad and broken in the world of RTOSs. And each company, each application has to invent their own. Maybe they're using a vendor service provider. Maybe they're trying to figure out, well, how do I use this protocol with this state machine to do integrate with this bootloader? It's it's just it's really tough. Um, it takes a takes a company to to solve this, even for a narrow set of use cases. And there are um, service providers that focus on um, maintaining the RTOS OS application, all its dependencies. But you kind of have to roll it your own, no matter what. And there's Mender and SW Update and Hawkbit and all these other uh, other solutions. But each time, it's I as a team have to figure out how to how to how to use it. Um, when you come to Linux, though, we have this rich ecosystem that's already used even by regular users, right? We have the package managers uh, that can be used even for an embedded Linux. Um, we have containers that actually make sense and if used correctly, can be a good um, software update story. Um, and like crazy uh, awesome ecosystems um, like Nix OS that's doing repeatable and, and distributed builds. Besides the fact that there are projects that exist, but they're not quite tied into the OS and, and missing some features to make this a little bit easier to use. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from the this this the systems that just kind of exist. Um, I'm going to switch to the next slide because I kind of put these together, and that's the bootloader. Um, because the relationship between the bootloader and the software update infrastructure uh, and in RTOS has actually always been separate, um, primarily because the world has been uh, of RTOS has been focused on the application, the firmware, the OS, the interface of the devices, and not with how it's going to get new versions of firmware. Um, and I think that Linux has a, a yep, yeah, yeah, Linux is equally complicated. Yeah, that's, that's t t totally fair, um, especially if you start going down um, some of those route, routes. Uh, 
but there's at least at least some good solutions there um, because of the bootloader. Um, there is no standardized bootloader or even a several standardized bootloaders for the world of um, our tosses. And that requires a deep integration between the mechanism to software updates. Um, and uh, you know, as, as the meet saying in, in the chat, it's still complicated to do OTA, but it's, it's, there's actually solutions. And I would argue that we don't really have good solutions. Um, uh, one area that I'm particularly excited about is MCU Boot. It's a project now under the Linar uh, Foundation um, organization. Uh, we're members of, of the MCU Boot project because it's trying to at least standardize the a secure bootloader. And um, we at Goliath, we can take advantage of that as part of our OTA infrastructure, because as long as it's running MCU boot, then we can have a secure boot and uh, the secure chain um, tight um, integrated with our OTA. Um, uh, it's, and I mean, saying that OTA in general is where companies are trying to make money with proprietary cloud solutions and open source clients. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, I, I think if it becomes more standardized, uh, that might become less and less uh, viable and that companies can make money on, on other parts of the stack. Uh, and I think that there's one more slide. Yeah, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about my last two slides because um, we're gonna get back to that. Uh, the last piece, which is um, I call it software integrity. Um, I'm trying to talk a little fast here, so uh, forgive me. Um, in the world of Linux, you know, scanning software, um, tools, uh, open source tools, um, tools provided by big companies like um, um, Fuzzing, those are all available and commonplace for embedded Linux. Um, or at least I've seen them used a ton. Um, and those don't really exist in the world of RTOS. I've seen startups trying to do it, um, but it's hard and uh, there's far and few between. Um, now, the other thing is that uh, the software supply chain, so the software bill of materials is what it's being commonly used, um, called now, um, is available. Um, and there's a project in the Linux Foundation uh, to make that uh, a thing. Um, it exists in our, uh, the world of Linux, but it also exists in the world of RTOS. And just, just starting to see that, um, for example, Zephyr, you can run a simple command and get your entire SBOM uh, output, uh, which is extremely, extremely novel, but it's the beginnings of having good software integrity. Um, our RTOS maybe um, have an approach that could maybe um, help the world of Linux is just the overall uh, approach to focusing on um, lines of code and having the least amount of um, lines of code actually makes it a little bit easier to verify that integrity. Um, it's a little bit easier to do software critical applications. So you can do software cert um, cert certification for those safety critical or mission critical type um, scenarios like IECs and ISO certifications. Um, you can do it with Linux, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's just easier and more commonplace that I've seen um, because of the nature of the, the um, the size and, and, and target, but also the effort that the uh, communities are putting into um, for, for sort of um, certification and for critical infrastructure. Um, there is a work in the Linux Foundation around uh, uh, safety critical Linux. Can't remember the name of the project, um, but I think that is, is great to see um, uh, moving forward. And in the last area, which is kind of like maybe far field and not talked about as much, and that's just generally comp um, confidential computing. I was going to call this just security and cryptography, but it's not quite what I was trying to get at, um, that Linux is leading the charge of thinking about confidential computing. So whether it's the TPMs and interfacing with HSMs, uh, just um, platform module or hardware security modules, um, or secure enclaves that are built into the, uh, um, the chips that are underneath it uh, and having um, access through SDKs and the actual OS itself, um, that's not really there yet in our tosses. Um, ARM has TrustZone, is extending TrustZone into the world of, of microcontrollers and therefore um, embedded operating systems, RTOS. Is. Um, and there's work being done in ITF, which we also participate on around uh, attestations, uh, trusted execution environments, and secure manifests, but it's all pretty nascent. And um, I think there's a lot to be learned from how Linux has been managing um, integrating those into, into the ecosystem. Uh, anyway, those are all the slides I had. Um, a quick summary, uh, as you can see, actually the world of RTOS has have a lot to learn from Linux and um, are continuing to, to start to uh, go down that direction. But of course, uh, Linux and learn from the world of our tosses. Um, this was a lot of fun, a lot of great discussion. I can't believe that uh, 57 minutes just uh, flew by. Um, but uh, I, if there's any last thoughts or questions, I'm around. Uh, I, I don't know how to, how to wrap this up, uh, but I'm looking over to Chris to give me some guidance. Sure. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I... 
I think uh, shortly after um, my last comment, I realized that we just jumped right into your talk. We didn't even take a break. Um, the whole Sorry day had flown by. Uh, and I think that everybody had really, really fantastic presentations. Um, yeah, it's hard to believe this is the third uh, Internet of Things Linux Plumage microconference. Uh, we accomplished a lot since last year, uh, even the year before that. Um, uh, this is our, this our, our second virtual, all virtual remote conference. Uh, I know uh, from Stefan as well, uh, I can't wait to get back to in-person. Uh, the in-person conference is most likely uh, my favorite that I've ever attended uh, for sure. Um, yeah, and we've learned so much today. Uh, we've got a lot of new um, contributions from new members to our microconference, uh, as well as a lot of, uh, uh, you know, really great feedback from past presenters and uh, people who have, who have had involvement in, in the IoT um, sort of subsystem, I guess, if you want to, we don't really have an IoT subsystem in Linux, but um, from the IoT ecosystem. Um, and again, I mean, there have been so many, um, really everything that we're doing on IoT builds upon the work that has already been done for, I guess Linux is 30 years old now. It's, it's unfathomable that it's that old because, I mean, I started using it out of my bedroom when I was, when I was a teenager. Um, uh, so it's, it's quite incredible that, you know, it's still, it's still such an amazing part of uh, what we do on a daily basis. So uh, I've taken presenter back um, and I'm just gonna go through um, the last slide that we have. So thanks for everybody for joining in, uh, for tuning in, everyone in Matrix, everyone on YouTube who's, who's been watching, um, all of the presenters, of course, all the developers that have contributed to everything that we've been able to achieve. Um, I just wanted to run through our sponsors uh, really quickly at the end. Uh, so this edition of Linux Plumbers has been brought to you by <laughs> uh, Facebook Diamond Sponsor. That's my employer. So thanks everybody at Facebook for making this possible. Um, and here, I'll just go through uh, the, the rest. Um, IBM Platinum, thank you very much. ARM and Microsoft Gold Sponsors, wonderful. Uh, we've got AWS, Netflix, and Red Hat as silver sponsors, all really great companies. Glad to have everybody involved in the community. Colabora, fantastic speaker gift sponsor. Uh, we had some speaker gifts issued this year, so uh, thanks again for that. Uh, VMware, t-shirt sponsor. Uh, I don't know if I was supposed to give away some t-shirts, but uh, you know, maybe uh, I missed that note memo. Uh, in any case, uh, if you would like t-shirts, please talk to Stephen Rostad. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, the Linux Foundation for Concrete Services. Uh, it's been really wonderful. Uh, and thanks again to everyone who's tuned in. And I hope to see you next year. Take care.